Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's virtual event, Process Automation for Competitive Advantage. I'm Teresa Resick, the Vice President of Market Intelligence here at AIM, and is, is your host and producer of our festivities today. Very much want to thank the underwriters of our virtual event. Um, and we have with us ActiveNav, Fujitsu Computer Products of America, IBM, Iron Mountain, Nintex, and Pyramid Solutions. And we also have contributions from Create Independent Consultants. Certainly want to thank you for taking the time to join us today as well. I appreciate the, your carving out, your, uh, carving out this time for your, from your valuable work day. Just as we get started, just want to offer a few logistics so that you can participate in today's event. Um, by joining live, you can, I encourage you to open up the chat feature, message with each other, message with us. Um, and right now, just go in there and let us know where you're listening from. It always is nice to know where around the world our audience is located. Um, and in this chat feature is also where um, Renee and I are going to be posting links throughout our time today. So things like resources, our agenda document, um, inside the, this agenda document is, um, and it is also linked in the resources. The agenda doc has a PDF of all the slides and uh, just so that you can follow along with everything that's going on today. Do ask questions of the presenters as we go along. We're taking questions at the end of each of their presentations. So um, encourage you to ask your questions as we keep going. Um, if you do need to step out, I would greatly appreciate it if you would take our survey. I always value your feedback on how we're doing today. And, uh, and so uh, we'll have the link in there for this feedback survey, but also at the very end when the event concludes, that survey will also launch out to you as well. We are recording things today, and um, we will send you a link to the replay either later today or tomorrow, as soon as that replay is available to you. And that way you can watch things again, invite your colleagues to come back and, and view it, and just enjoy the lineup of speakers that we have for you today. And joining us as our host and MC throughout all of our activities today is Kevin Crane. And Kevin is the host and producer of AIM on Air podcast series. And he's also the author of many of AIM's eBooks and infographics and tip sheets. And I have the pleasure of working alongside him on so many projects here at AIM. So Kevin, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Teresa. Thanks a lot. It's great to be here today uh, talking about process automation for competitive advantage. And I think this is a really important discussion for a couple of reasons, we have two converging forces at play today that are influencing how businesses are conducting their business and how we do our jobs in information management. Rising levels of both information overload and escalating customer expectations about how organizations use information for things like service and experience. So in order to remain competitive, it's more crucial than ever before that organizations commit to moving away from manual processes. And that's what we're here to talk about today, process automation for competitive advantage. According to new research here at AIM, nearly 70% of AIM member respondents tell us that they feel that their organization's efforts to digitize processes are only average at best. Many say that they desperately need improvement and some admit that their performance is poor. So how can we adopt process automation techniques that really move the needle and help our organizations build competitive advantage? That's what we're here to talk about. We've asked our lineup of speakers today to explore this territory, look for ways to break through the obstacles and find the right opportunities by taking a holistic look at process automation through best practices and educational takeaways and real world insights. How are organizations using our process automation initiatives have the greatest and fastest ROI? What are the barriers and what are the best practices? So settle in, get your notepad handy, um, and let's dig in, starting with Peggy Winton. It's really my pleasure to welcome Peggy Winton back to our event today. Peggy, are you with us? I am here. So good uh, to hello, see Hello, Peggy. Hi. All right. Well, Peggy is with us. She's going to be looking at some key trends and feedback. Um, from research conducted over the just the past few months with AIM community members, looking at what kinds of applications and activities are being targeted for uh, automation and how users are doing it. What's their experience? Peggy, please tell us more. Well, thanks, Kevin. Great to see you. And it is so fun to see how many people are connecting from uh, places far and wide. 
And no wonder, this is such an important topic. As you said, Kevin, we've learned a lot of things over the last 16 months. And one of those things is that paper-based and manual processes just aren't going to cut it, uh, particularly not in a work from home world. How many businesses were just disrupted and really um, in in pretty deep trouble when all of this uh, happened so, so quickly. So that pendulum uh, that swang so widely uh, to uh, remote work is eh, not completely going to swing back. And I hope that so many of you have have learned. And remember that the paper you push out uh, to your customers and members of your supply chain has a horrible way of coming back to haunt you. So I'm going to repeat a few of the things that Kevin said, because I think they are so important. And they really set the baseline, I think, and the tone for what we want to talk about today. And Kevin's right. Uh, This year is really shaping up to be almost a year of reckoning. And we say that for the two reasons that Kevin said. One is that the information chaos that we've been talking about for so many years now, uh, for many of us, that's our uh, reason for being, that's our permission to play. It's only accelerating. It's, it's not getting better. You all feel it, those uh, increasing volumes and varieties of information that is swirling around your organizations. We've already lost the ability to uh, control it and manage it. Add to that the customer expectations for convenience and availability that only, uh, only got crazier. Uh, last year. I always say uh, nothing screams pandemic um, like the need for convenience and availability. I need it now, even if it's just toilet paper. Um, So those two forces combine. And what's, what's the common denominator in this? Content. And this is all about content in content text. And I think that's a differentiator for AIM uh, in this information management world, because we've got to move away from thinking of our information and thinking of our content and thinking of our records simply in a cost or risk mitigation mindset. We really need to think about the innovation side and the enablement side. So let's look at each of these two converging forces uh, a little bit, and then let's get into some of the drivers. We did. We came out very, very recently and asked you, how would you grade your own organization in managing your information chaos? And if you look at all this, the average across the board is a C minus. Now, these are aimers. These are not people outside of the aim community. community. Uh, it's, it's many of you who are uh, information management practitioners and professionals. And if you graded your organizations a C minus, imagine what the rest of the world looks like. Eh, yikes. So clearly organizations are losing the battle when it comes to information chaos. And we all need to rethink outdated approaches to it. One of the obvious culprits is manual processes. Add to that the second driver I talked about, that customer expectation that is increasing. We're feeling those pressures more than ever before. Organizations also need the ability to embrace rapid change and spark innovation and drive superior superior results. And what's an obvious way to do that? Transforming your key business processes. So take a look at where we've been over the last few years. And 
those foundational business process management aspirations that were tied to traditional ECM, enterprise content management. That functionality is still very much relevant, but the business drivers and the targets and the solutions, those are evolving and changing very rapidly. So I like to uh, think about drivers, targets, and solutions as the why, the what, and the how. So let's take a look um, at some of the key trends that have just been revealed as a result of this research. Kevin mentioned it. I hope you all know that we regularly come out to the extended AIM community and ask you about what's, what's driving some of your decisions and your investment in information management. Are you finding some obstacles that you have to overcome? Um, we collate and, and analyze all of that information and we try to uh, digest it and, and put it in a report that's easily consumable for you. And those reports are free. So if you're not already availing yourselves of those uh, resources, please do. And uh, we've got them as links for you today that you can download and share with your colleagues. But we're going to ask, we, we asked why you and your organizations are pursuing some of these automation initiatives and, and why now. Uh, what kinds of applications are out? activities are the targets for those efforts, and how are you accomplishing that? So let's take a look. We are seeing uh, a shift. I mentioned that, uh, that move from just the uh, mitigation and sort of uh, cost uh, mitigation and, and risk mitigation to something bigger, uh, something that looks at that customer centricity. So let's little dig a little bit uh, deeper into why organizations are undertaking a process automation project. You won't be surprised. Efficiency uh, to reduce the time it takes to complete a process and costs to reduce the cost of a particular process. Th that's understandable, right? Um, that's always been an aspiration. But there's another set of themes in this data that's reflected if you aggregate the bottom three responses. It's actually over half. And that is improving customer satisfaction, growing new revenues, and expanding market reach. These responses focused on customer experience and customer acquisition are directly tied to the importance that I think leading organizations now play on the understanding and the mapping of cross departmental processes and customer journeys. That's such an important um, play now. Customer journeys, customer mapping, and overcoming uh, at the same time that information chaos that threatens all of these objectives. So this is a real dynamic shift from what we've been tracking in years prior. And be mindful of that. And I hope your organizations are thinking differently there too. So where do organizations face the greater challenge in dealing with their information chaos? Our results suggest that the answer lies at a, a pretty familiar point for AIM audiences. Can you think about that? Look, look at what that 25% reveals. Well, it's at the intersection of content and processes because that's where it's at. And when asked to describe their biggest information management challenge, a full 25% of you said um, it's that trying to digitize and automate and integrate our processes, to integrate our processes. So let's dig a little deeper into just what aspects of your business are most in need of modernized and automated efforts. 60% of you see production processes, and those are usually repetitive and run over and over again, um, mostly using some kind of standard operating procedure. Um, that's your primary target of, of automation efforts right now, but 
look at the uh, look at the four uh, the blue uh, section. That's forty percent. That's not too shabby. Um, forty percent of you see your primary target as more ad hoc processes. So those are ones that require some personal judgment. Um, there, there might be just some exceptions there. Um, they're usually unique. Sometimes they're seldom used, but you shouldn't clock those if they aren't also a strategic uh, and, and important to your business. So think about that. Think about it. Organizations focus on production processes because that's where the most pain is, particularly as you expand your focus from individual processes to broader customer journeys. And there's that customer word again. This is where newer technologies, I hope you've heard of robotic process automation or RPA for short. This is where these kinds of technologies can really play uh, an increasingly important role because they democratize process automation tools and allow um, individual knowledge workers to automate pockets of manual work that they see are in really important, particularly for their customers. And um, that manual work uh, still exists within so much of production processes. But interesting, RPA is not even on the radar screen for a lot of the organizations we talk to. Um, the technology is, is somewhat mature, but it's still in the early stages of adoption. And I think it's because there's just a lot of confusion around what RPA can and can't do, uh, particularly when you're talking about scaling it up. And like anything, it takes planning uh, and regular retooling as your processes, uh, the governance surrounding those, and other factors uh, are changing as well. A few years ago, we uh, did a little analogy of uh, RPA and the Roomba. Do you know the Roomba, the automatic uh, vacuum that goes uh, skirting around your floor? Uh, we said, you know, think about a, a, a Roomba. Uh, it leaves a little bit to be desired when it hits something like a uh, a chair leg or trying to go upstairs. So it's not the panacea, but it really can um, create more value work for, uh, for knowledge workers. So when asked about the capabilities you believe are most required to solve your information management issues, um, there's one at the top of the list, and that is integrating content into core business processes. Those processes likely have customer service and satisfaction implications. So I hope you're detecting a theme here. But it's not easy uh, because 54% of the information that most of us need within a, a particular business application, the information that's really exciting to us because it has a lot of customer intel, that doesn't sit in a nice, tidy, central content repository all the time. 54% of that actually is stored within the application itself. And that's why so many of you say that simply managing the documents and the content, uh, the content you need uh, as knowledge workers to get your job done, and I would add serve your customer, uh, is, is a particular challenge, is a problem to you. So we really see that many business functions are almost reaching a tipping point for automation. And that's the point where processes just become uh, so critical to accomplishing tasks with a high degree of quality and in a, in a timely manner. Again, that's what our customers are demanding. And this is particularly true when organizations are receiving information through a huge, just a real diverse um, delivery channel. 
that's the way the world is with complicated and extended uh, supply chains and, and value chains. You're realizing that your processes just can't really be automated fully until the unstructured information that underlies them is in some kind of machine readable form. That's where the real heft comes from. And you need to think about artificial intelligence and machine learning that can take additional friction out of classifying that incoming information and assigning relevant metadata to it. And we know we can't leave that to humans. Uh, we don't want to do it. We don't necessarily do it well because we're not trained to do it. And we certainly can't keep up with that pace. So I suggest that you should investigate that. You can really uh, speed up the pace of your automation efforts by adopting these technologies, a lot of which are pre-built in uh, the applications that you're using today. And it makes it it makes AI uh, much more accessible to um, businesses that you wouldn't think uh, could could realize the value and and the promise of it and um, the attraction and why it's it's so uh, popular with the business is that even non technical uh, folks can use it. So let's take a look at um, some of the things that that's leading to. Um, I mentioned process owners. Um, after all, who better than the process owners themselves to lead those content-driven automation efforts? That's really the key drivers for uh, what are known as low-code application platforms. These are self-service platforms. Um, some of them are declarative, like drop and drag or drag and drop, um, that allow organizations to really improve the business outcomes of all kinds of work, not just structured and repeatable business processes. And as your organization attempts to tackle your next wave of challenges around process, you, um, you need, you're looking for platforms that are more nimble and more agile and more easily deployed, again, by the business. That's who's really, really leading the charge uh, when it comes to creating a superior customer experience. Now, the interesting thing about low-code applications and self-service platforms is that it allows knowledge workers who aren't necessarily IT, they're not trained as programmers or developers, um, you can really uh, avoid the constraints of some of the traditional ECM and BPM approaches um, that frankly were never known for uh, simplicity or uh, speed. Uh, no, they had pretty complex development cycles and long ones at that. Um, some of them had uh, uh, investment um, uh, implications that uh, were prohibitive for a lot of organizations. So it's not surprising that the interest in these platforms is, um, is growing. And it's also uh, really generated by just the sheer volume of automation requests that are often pretty tactical uh, and immediate, but yet they're the ones that sit in a long um, IT development queue. You know, you've, you've, you've been frustrated by that. You might have heard the term uh, citizen developer that's used in, in uh, context with low code. A lot of organizations find that low code platforms can, um, can bring about a significant and more immediate ROI. So rather than require a whole team of programmers and specially qualified analysts, low code offers a way for um, organizations to see improvements and innovations in workflows and systems without a lot of additional support or expertise. And they're being applied to some pretty common business activities like, think about it, invoice processing, customer onboarding, or even regulatory reporting. And as the research shows us, 
uh, use of low code technologies is still pretty much in the early stages uh, of adoption as well, much like um, RPA. But I would challenge you to say that in uh, an era of both information chaos and customer expectations, don't lose sight of those two drivers we shared at the beginning, it's, it's more critical than ever that organizations make a commitment to move away from manual processes and the stakes for digital competence is rising. Um, organizations put their very organizations at stake if they don't automate. And I would say that's whenever and wherever they can. So, in the next few minutes, let me just share uh, a key obstacle that you shared with us and uh, maybe a, a, a bit of advice as we send you forward. Um, we see that while process automation aspirations may not have changed over the past few years, the approaches and the potential end results certainly have. What used to be a guessing game or out of reach for most organizations. Again, because of the commitment of, uh, of uh, expertise or uh, resources, uh, money and, and, and labor um, is now very much achievable. And that's what's so exciting. Uh, it's also a real imperative. There's, there's no excuse anymore. Um, but we understand still overcoming the misperceptions, I think, of what, the, what it takes to get started. What are those initial costs and lack of stakeholder buy-in? Um, that is a big obstacle, um, but, but the other obstacles have almost been removed. So we're going to talk a lot about that in subsequent sessions. And you know we talk about it a lot at AIM. How do you change the conversations so that you do uh, reach uh, a discussion about value? Uh, versus just risk. Um, you don't want eyes rolling. You want people to uh, get excited about uh, what's possible. But it is a challenge. We know that. So let me leave you uh, with a little piece of advice from AIMS Certified Information Professionals. You know, this is a group of individuals that have mastered the practice that we call intelligent information management. So CIPs have uh, made that commitment. They've amassed some years of experience. They've uh, passed our rigorous exam. And we uh, look to them very much uh, regularly for some advice. And um, we hope that it's prescriptive advice that you can take and use. And we recently talked to them about this, this challenge of stakeholder buy-in and executive buy-in and championship. Um, and their advice is to um, do what you can to do some storytelling and try to educate what are probably stressed out colleagues. Let's face it, they're doing more with less. They're already stressed out. How can you educate them about why the change needs to occur from a business strategy? perspective, not just because it's good business or not just because of new regulations, especially when automating is important for the individuals to understand how the solution is going to improve their work environment, simplify their life and let them get on with some high value, much more exciting and impactful work. But don't stop there. Once you've established the reason for the change, the why, be very clear on how. How is it going to happen um, and when it will evolve? So hopefully that's, uh, that's a little uh, bit of uplifting advice and uh, really excited, Kevin, to um, have our listeners hear some exciting use cases of uh, organizations in a variety of industries. These are, these are your peers. Um, listen to what they've done. And we always say, pick something that is um, not trivial in your organization that can be tackled, 
but make sure that it's it's doable and and celebrate those quick wins. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the sessions and uh, back to you, Kevin. Thank you, Peggy. That is Peggy Winton. Um, and Peggy, I got to say, I think this most recent information uh, watch report that we've been working with over the last couple months here is probably one of the best reports we've had in recent history. Uh, some really interesting and somewhat uh, some sometimes a bit uh, inspiring or disturbing findings in the information watch report. I know I'll be covering some of uh, further findings from that report in my keynote later this afternoon. But thank you so much for setting up, this, uh, setting the stage for us today um, and sharing your thoughts about uh, where we sit and what our, cu our customers and users are saying today. Thanks. Now, Always my pleasure. Thanks. Now, let's move on. Uh, Teresa, I believe it is now time for our first poll question. Teresa, are you with us? Yes, I am. And I've just launched a poll out to everyone. And uh, we decided to move the poll to after Peggy's keynote, because after you you know, heard some of that uh, inspiring discussion and, and to put into context of where things are and how it's all working in your organization right now, um, we thought this was the time to ask this first question, which summer activity best describes your organization's progress in autom automating information intensive processes? Is it a traffic jam? We're at a standstill and no, we're not there yet. Is it a roller coaster? We're having our ups and downs and it's a little bit bumpy. Is it a lazy river? We're in a smooth, steady flow and moving in the right direction. Or is it go-karts? We're zooming past everyone to the finish line. So I just want to give you a quick second to answer that question there. And um, I Looks, looks like you're all are still answering it. Um, I just want to take a quick second to look at the results. And so let me go ahead and stop the poll and share results. And it looks like the overwhelming response, about 41% of the respondents here today are saying it's a roller coaster, ups and downs. Um, is this surprising to you, Kevin? I, no, not at all. In fact, I was thinking maybe demolition derby. <laughs> <laughs> Monster point. truck. Roller coaster sounds about right. Well, thank you, everyone. Just a little bit of lighthearted activity as we start our activities today um, following Peggy's wonderful keynote. So let me turn it back to Kev and to get on to our next presenter. All right. Very good. Well, all right. Next up, we have Scott Francis with us. Scott, are you there? Scott, Francis, are you with us? I see you, Scott, but I don't hear you. I am here. Aha, there we are. Scott Francis. Scott, welcome to the event today. Scott Francis is with us. He is a technology evangelist with Fujitsu Computer Products of America. And listen, business agility and collaboration are now more important than ever. We heard about it from Peggy. Now with Scott, he's going to be talking about digital transformation on the edge of rapid IT changes to cloud adoption. Scott, please tell us more. All right. Well, Kevin, thank you for the introduction. And Peggy, thanks for leading us off today. Um, Kevin, as you mentioned at the start, this is process automation for competitive advantage. And the key to having that competitive advantage is that business agility the speed of business and being able to protect confidential information. So all of those are key pillars to have that competitive advantage. Peggy talked about how manual processes are bad. I completely agree. Paper is not the issue. Paper is a great way to ingest information from your customers. If you're in healthcare, if you're in finance, if you're in a government application, manufacturing, retail, you name the vertical, your customers still want to interact with you on paper. Having born digital forms are great as well, but being able to give customers a variety of ways to interact with you is clearly going to deliver the best customer service. And even for electronic processes, there's still a lot of backup documentation and wet signatures that are required to be captured. So paper as an input is fine. It is the management of paper. It's the manual processes that need to be eradicated from business in order to increase that speed of business and really deliver that competitive advantage. 
So Fujitsu being the leader in document scanners, we've had a lot of input from you, our customers, about what's important to you. And we know that scanning information at the point that your organization ingests that paper is critical. We've been working on enhancing that solution. Um, and this slide really lines it up. Knowledge workers have a day job. They don't necessarily want to be IT experts. The key is to allow them to use paper, to be able to capture paper, but not to where it interrupts their job. It's got to be easy to use, and it needs to be versatile in how they use it, when they use it, and where they use it. And of course, we've got some great speakers behind me today. The key to process automation is artificial intelligence. And the key to artificial intelligence is having clear data on the front end of that process. So when we talk about ingesting paper, it's got to be easy, it's got to be accurate, and it's got to be fast. And the information has to be versatile in how it connects to a wide variety of systems. And Peggy showed a slide about priorities, uh, cost savings, um, productivity, customer satisfaction, revenue expansion. Um, surprise security wasn't higher on that list, and I think on the next survey it will be. Um, that's another reason for paper. When an a organization has a security compromise, being able to use paper still allows that business to move forward until that security situation is resolved. But these are all key reasons to capture information on the edge. All right, so on this slide, on the left, you can see how we've been capturing documents for the last 30 years. Scan applications are installed on Windows PCs. When knowledge workers need to scan, they have to engage that application. They scan documents from within that application. Those images go through that PC and then off to the capture workflow and then the backend system. Those applications can be complex and that uh, causes a lot of calls to the help desk. More so, it requires companies to purchase, place, and maintain those scanner PCs, and that's an added cost as well. On the right is our PaperStream NX platform. It's the new way to scan. Our FI7300 NX scanner is a wireless scanner. It can also be connected via network cable, but it doesn't require a PC. That allows you to place it wherever your business requires it. It can be in a warehouse. You can capture packing uh, receipts, and you don't have to have a PC connected to it. It can be on a construction site to capture those change order documents. It could be in a common accounting area or in a front counter application, wherever you need to interact with paper. Users can walk up, log into the units, and they get specific job buttons. And I'll show you that on the next slide. They load their documents, choose a job button, and those documents go off into those automated applications. It's easy for the users. Training is not required. And that is a key element to accelerating these processes. So again, no PCs are required. All the user accounts, by the way, are managed on a server. So an IT person can remotely administer this system without having to go from scanner to scanner to scanner. Unlike other solutions, when you make changes on the server, they are instantly available on the scanner. And the documents go right from the scanner to the server, so it's more secure. There's no digital trail of images on a scan PC or on a tablet or on a phone. That could be an information compromise. The images go directly to the server. This server-based solution is great for on-premise. It's even better for the cloud. All right, so here it is in action. Users walk up and log in. It has an NFC card reader right on the scanner itself, which means the login process can just take a couple of seconds. In this example, the user's logging in, and we're using Active Directory to authenticate them. We provide a number of different authentication options to match what your uh, company is using. From there, once the user has been authenticated, their job buttons are downloaded right to the screen. It's in 
intuitive, easy to use. We can match those job buttons right to those processes. The images are scanned directly to the server. Our paper stream IP enhances the image. This is the other critical part. That image enhancement is going to produce the best OCR and ICR result, which means whatever downstream process is using those images will be more accurate. Here we're hosting the solution in the Microsoft Azure cloud. They can go right into blob storage. And then from there, any application that can use blob storage and ingest images from them can uh, ingest those images. But that's not all. We also support Microsoft's 365 complete stack. So if you want to scan to Outlook email, if you want to scan to SharePoint or Teams, you can do that as well. But far more importantly, we have an application layer where we support over 30 ISV applications. This is great for any watch folder application. So Nintex, IBM Workflow are on today's call. This is an awesome way to drop images into RPA, into automated workflows. You get all the benefits of being able to easily deploy this solution. Your workers can easily use it and you've got the versatility of all those different applications. And better yet, because this platform supports different application integrations, a single user can have different job profiles for multiple application. So a single knowledge worker could scan the email. They can also scan into a content management system. They can scan directly into an automated workflow. They can scan into an EMR application if they're in healthcare or a case management application if they're in government. It's extremely versatile and that really delivers that agility that businesses need. And here's an example of PSIP. This is adaptive thresholding. What that means is we're looking at every page and every part of the page to figure out the right image enhancement settings not just brightness and contrast, but the ability to pull out information to improve that OCR or ICR. So on the left is a HICFA form on the left. In the middle, you can see standard thresholding. On the right, you can see Fujitsu's adaptive thresholding. This is another X factor in our solution. Our scanners have great paper handling, they have great speed, but that image quality is what's critical for process automation. When we have errors in OCR and ICR, all of those processes shut down. I loved Peggy's example about the Roomba. It's gonna hit a stair. It's not gonna know what to do. That's gonna require manual intervention. With this technology, you're gonna minimize those manual interventions. So here's a, a use case. So let's talk about Zooland. They're a fictitious company and they sell pet supplies around their regional area. And of course, this is transferable, but they have on site um, pet grooming, pet adoptions, and they've got paper based forms for those processes. For the pet adoptions, they've got to scan ID cards as well. They're onboarding employees locally. So they've got I 9 forms, other employee consent forms. They've got to capture on site. They are purchasing inventory and receiving inventory locally. So they've got to reconcile that information with the corporate system as well. And they've got inventory documents, things like cycle documents. They need to scan all of those. Again, these workers have a day job. The FI7300 NX can easily be deployed remotely. The company doesn't have to send IT people on site because the scanners can be pre-configured and then they can be managed remotely. From there, job buttons for those users are simply created for the workflows above. When they've got one of those processes, they walk up to the scanner, log in, load their documents and hit a button and they can go back to doing their job. That's the speed and agility that businesses need. It's a great solution for your knowledge workers. They'll be happy to use it. So they're not fighting the system. That came out in the survey slides that we saw earlier today as well. This is a great solution, not only for the customer, but for your workers as well. This is fully transferable to healthcare, government, finance, manufacturing, any company that has multiple locations or any company that has multiple ingestion points within a single location. This is great technology. So here on this slide, you can see 
the way we've been selling millions of scanners over the last 30 years. It works great, but there is a better way with our PaperStream NX platform and our FI7300 NX scanner. And this week, we've also announced Edge Experience, which is a hosted cloud solution on Microsoft's Azure platform. This allows you to implement this solution without setting up a server on site. So this is just another way that you can consume scanning your way. And this is an industry first offering because it's not just a hosted cloud software as a service, it's also hardware as a service. You can actually lease scanners or the, and the hosted cloud server. So if you're a company and you wanna have 10 of those FI7300 NX scanners, no problem. You can su subscribe to them and you can also have a hosted server. And that gives you all the benefits of the cloud. So when you think about that, you're gonna get all of Microsoft's top security. And because the scanners are scanning directly to the server, the platform itself is highly secure. And those images are encrypted with 256-bit encryption from start to finish. And this is scalable. Peggy talked about scalability, business agility. This is the perfect way to move forward. You can start with a set number of scanners and a level of your server. Our base server supports 25,000 scans. You can scale up from that as you need it. And you can pay as you go. So you don't have to make a huge upfront investment. This is another great change condition that will help businesses get started faster and for a lower upfront cost. You can even use operating expense. So if your capital expense budgets are annual and you've got to wait until next year to purchase that system on site, no problem. Use operating expense and do it now. In terms of management, you can deploy this solution in just over an hour. It's easy to do. You don't have to purchase a server, wait for it to arrive, fully install it. No, it's all done for you. And this is critical as a business. You want to focus on your customers. You want to focus on your products and services. You don't want to be solving IT headaches. We do that lifting for you. And when updates and patches come for the operating system, for our service, for our scanners, it's all done for you. It's a mobile solution. So talk about work from home. When you get all these images into the cloud, you can access them securely anytime, anywhere. And that goes for your customers as well. And that's another part of that competitive advantage. And this system is green because you're only using what you need. You're not having to overbuy that system. So it's exciting to talk to all the AIM members today. We'd love to talk to you more. So in terms of moving forward, if you've got questions about our new platform, if you've got questions about the best way to scan your paper documents and automate those processes, we'd be happy to help you. You can reach me on Twitter. We have a team of solution analysts that can do a needs analysis. We've got a great team to support you. I just want to thank everyone for listening today, and I'm looking forward to working with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. That is Scott Francis, Technology Evangelist with Fujitsu Computer Products of America. Scott, we have a few questions coming in. Um, before we do, I, I really love the way you've given us some examples of exactly how this scenario and how these approaches can be applied. Um, can you tell us about one instance where you feel that this has helped us gain a competitive advantage? Is there uh, an example that you might give of one organization or use case that you feel really helps that organization gain a competitive edge? Yes, yeah, so um, we've had a couple of great projects with this technology. Um, one of them is a federal government agency who's using this in a work from home environment. So they're literally scanning case files at home locations and they're able to do that much faster. So instead of sending paper from point A to point B, they can actually scan that paper that they are annotating at their home location and they can get it into the system much faster and in a secure manner. When you're sending paper from one location to the other, it's got to be scanned and then it's got to be indexed and committed to the system. When you do it on the edge, all of that scanning, all of that initial classification is done 
at that location. And then when you combine AI on top of that to intelligently classify and extract, those business processes go much faster. Another example would be retail, where companies are able to scan customer forms right at the location and send those into corporate. Because the solution is easy to use, those knowledge workers can quickly get those forms scanned right to corporate, and then it allows corporate to respond to those customers in real time. When we talk about customer service, Kevin, it's all about the speed of response and the ability to secure and not lose information. When you lose a customer credit application, for instance, A, you're not approving their loan in real time, B, you're asking them to send it again. All of that creates a lot of confusion. And worse, if you somehow lose that confidential information, that's even a worse problem. So those are all examples of how this gives companies a competitive advantage. Security, reliability, and speed. We have a question coming in from Linda Cooper. Linda, thank you so much for offering a question in the chat. And please feel free, everyone, to do so. But Linda asks, how does this improvement affect the size of the resulting file? Great, great question. So with PaperStream IP, we're using adaptive thresholding to do things like remove watermarks or reduce the background, also enhancing the text. So all of that does two things. It enhances the image as well as the recognition, but it also decreases the file size. And that's great when those images are moving across a wide area network, they're moving over the internet. So this technology is built to minimize file size, but maximize the legibility of the image and the recognition accuracy. Now, Scott, when I think of scanning or many people think of scanning, I think maybe of the of a centralized on-premise operations, maybe a high volume scanning. You're talking about distributed scanning on the edge of the organization uh, with knowledge workers in process at the point of entry into the into the organization uh, optimally, um, what are some different aspects we should consider? Different requirements, different capabilities that are different among knowledge workers compared to dedicated scanner operators. Yeah, that's a great question, Kevin. You know, when we talk about dedicated scanner operators, these are full time employees that become experts at using scanners. When you talk about scanning documents on the edge, A, you've got a lot of employee turnover. That is employees who are new to using the technology. Training can be an issue if the solution is complex. So when we talk about scanning at the edge, it's gotta be easy and intuitive. Even if there are moderate training requirements, chances are employees are gonna forget They're not gonna do things in a consistent manner and they're gonna be calling for support. Those employees are also going to be frustrated, which is gonna be another hindrance on them wanting to do the system. And all those things equate to documents not being scanned in real time, which um, makes those processes suffer and makes customer service suffer. So it's gotta be easy and it's gotta be accessible. If they have to walk 15 yards over to a centralized area to use an MFP or a different type of input device, it's another tax on the speed of their job. So that's another aspect of this. It's got to be close. It's got to be easy. And it's got to be reliable. If they're having to do that scanning multiple times because there's a paper jam or an image quality issue, that's another frustration (laughs) point. Very good. That is Scott Francis. Technology Evangelist, Fujitsu Computer Products of America. Scott, thank you so much for being with us on the event today. Thank you for having me. All right, well, let's move on. Next up, we are joined by George Dunn. Now, George has kindly provided a video for us to to view today, but he will be with us after the video for some live Q&A. So are we set for that video? Teresa. Yes, we are. Let me get this started for us. All right. Very good. Well, let me do a formal introduction then for George Dunn. George is president of Create Incorporated Independent Consultants. He is focused on enterprise content management and process improvement. Let's hear that 
and see that video from George now. Hi, my name is George Dunn and I'm president of Create Independent Consultants and I'd like to thank AIM for allowing me to present today on how to develop a business process focused digital transformation plan and why that is important to your organization. A little bit about my journey, my organization journey. We've been in business since 1995 and have assisted hundreds of organizations with planning for digital transformation, process improvement and update of their governance programs. We've worked with all kinds of advanced technologies. We're going to talk a little bit more about those. RPA, digital workflow, electronic content management, AI, machine learning. But we've also approached each project looking at how can we improve the process using methods such as TQM, re-engineering, BPM, Lean Six Sigma. We're going to talk a little bit more too today on why those methodologies are important and why you should not just jump to the technology and implement. Uh, we've also reviewed and updated governance programs, so it's been a, a fun journey. Our organizations we've worked with have ranged from 25 employees up to 250,000. Um, and as independent consultants, we do not sell or resell hardware or software, so we work directly for you, the end user. So why is digital transformation important? Well, the fact is today, organizations are under pressure to improve operational quality, accuracy, efficiency, and service. They're under pressure to reduce errors, reduce friction, liability, audit issues and penalties. They've got to find qualified staff, reduce operating costs, and also recover from the pandemic. So how do we do all this at one time as a CTO or as a chief or a director or a manager? Well, we do it through digital transformation. What is digital transformation? It's using these advanced technologies to uh, automate manual tasks, reduce processing time, make better decisions, eliminate errors, and improve service to our customers. What are the tools of digital transformation? As I mentioned earlier, recognition, machine learning, um, e-signature, digital workflow. If we had more time than 10 minutes, I'd go through every one of these in detail, but we're just gonna listen through RPA, artificial intelligence, ECM, advanced reporting. These are fantastic technologies, but there are challenges. You know, We conduct these studies all the time, and we also interview people that have implemented the technologies. Challenges include sprawl, unplanned growth, it's not good. Sustainable budgets, if you don't have those, well, you're gonna run out of gas halfway in your journey. And part of that is you cannot take a try and buy method uh, approach, you know, because if you're gonna go for these technologies, do the proper planning up front, find where they're gonna produce the highest benefit for your organization, and then allocate the time and dollars to do it. The other challenge is ROI, because a lot of organizations, as I mentioned, they'll jump into the technology and they can't prove it out. We've come up with an approach to do that that I want to share with you. So the first is, the question is, why have a business process focused approach to digital transformation? Why not just implement it? Well, a business process focused plan um, looks at each process first, and it doesn't have to be in detail. It's basically, we, we conduct a process inventory and identify what processes need to be improved, what's the level of improvement required to make them function better, what's the goal? Where should we clean up the process before automation? There's an old saying, automate the mess, get a faster mess, right? Let's clean up the process. And then use also process improvement methodologies then in conjunction with the advanced technologies to really supercharge what the results are gonna be. And we've done this again and again, and I'm telling you, it really works. Um, advantages of this kind of approach is you're going to have a process focused plan versus sprawl occurring uh, where users are deciding what to do, what to automate, and then budgets get challenged and projects, you know, fade out. That's, that's a problem. You're going to have a greater return on investment. You're going to know where to focus your time and dollars in the organization. Maybe it's those cross-functional processes that are more difficult. Maybe it's individual processes that are repeatable. Uh, maybe it's a combination of that and department processes. You can have a coordinated plan and effort. You will be able to create sustainable project, pro projects and budgets by being able to go to your executive committees and saying, these are the areas that we feel are most need of digital transformation. Here's the cost. Here's our timeline. And um, they get you started on the right foot. Uh, reduction of change orders. You know, if you get in the cab and you don't know which direction you're going, that's called a change order. So we're going to, you know, make that... Uh, significantly less and, and hopefully eliminate that completely by doing the planning. And we, and we find that's, that's what happens. And increase user acceptance. That's important, right? 
So when planned for correctly, digital transformation uh, can provide a 25% to a 10x ROI. It's absolutely phenomenal. What are the areas that can benefit from digital transformation? All areas. But the question is, where is the highest value and what is your roadmap? So let's talk about how to do it. The first is develop an enterprise or department plan to identify uh, which processes are in need of, of, of uh, benefit from these technologies. So first is, what's the scope? Is it going to be enterprise-wide? Is it going to be department? Are you going to focus on cross-functional processes, group individual processes, or a combination of all? Um, are you going to look at a customer-based process, a vendor-based processes, your supply chain, or processes that are in need of improvement from a governance perspective? So the first is identifying where to, you know, what processes we want to work with, um, or in need of improvement, the level of improvement. And it's going to be, it needs to be more than what you might think initially. You know, if your customers, if you produce something in 10 days for $10, but your customers want it in three days for $3, the level of improvement is very different. You may have to jump to a re-engineering approach and totally change the way the process occurs. But in essence, the first part is to develop a well thought out um, enterprise-wide plan and roadmap of what are the projects and what's the cost to do them and the return on investment. For the top projects identified, then I think it's important to drill down, you know, and also, first of all, identify what are the methods that you want to use. So, for example, if you need a radical improvement, re-engineering would be a good approach, clean sheet of paper. Uh, if you need to eliminate waste or errors, lean, uh, reduce defects, uh, Six Sigma, uh, continuous process improvement, CPI, reducing friction, frictionless. So part of this is that as we go into these projects and as you go into them, what are the right tool sets you're going to use to improve and clean that process up and then supercharge it with the technology? Nothing's going to happen by itself. So it's, it needs to be planned. So here's some checklists. I like checklists. I'm going to, you know, we only got 10 minutes here. So the first is on your digital transformation plan, your business process focused digital transformation plan. What's the scope of the, of the plan and of the projects? Um, what are the digital technologies you're going to assess? It's hard to do all of them at one time, but you can. We've done that. We have a different columns. We rate the process on current state and how it would benefit from recognition or RPA or digital workflow. Provide education to the users because, you know, they're part of it, right? And then interview the users and rank their processes um, based upon what are the current errors or quality of the process? Um, how is the customer service? What's the friction in the process? Um, are there compliance issues? Uh, what's the risk of the process day to cause problems? Uh, and importantly too, what's the volume going through the process of transactions? And what's the FTE allocation? The neat thing about a study like this is the CTO is gonna get a roadmap but the CEO, CFO is gonna get their cost per process. They've never seen this before. It's really amazing because you start to think in a different way when you apply, what is, what's it costing you per process? Maybe some of these processes shouldn't exist. So let's not automate them, right? But it, it, it gives you an idea of how to approach it. And, and from that, develop a multi-year roadmap. For the top projects identified, map out the current state. What's the current process? What are the issues? What's the KPIs? map the future state. Where are we going to go? Some people say, well, can't I just map the future state? Well, if you want to have user confidence, you need to clearly understand how they work today and what are all the twists and turns and the unhappy paths in the process. Then you can really go to work on helping to improve the process to make your employees happier and your customers happier. Also, we want to know what are the goals of the future state process? They could be very different than your current state. So it's, this is a thought process. We drill down, articulate, our baseline and our, our 2B environment. Identify what kind of procedural changes are necessary to clean up the process before automation, uh, develop change action plan, and then develop our technology requirements. How will the technology impact the process? What does it need to look like? What are our conceptual requirements? Vendors love this because the users have put the work into this, but they need to be led through this by yourself or by a consultant that knows how to do this because uh, then you've done your homework. And then implementation becomes a snap. Okay, if you don't do this, the vendor just starts to automate. It's not going to be a snap. It's going to be a snafu, right? Um, develop your project plan timeline, quality assurance, documentation, all the, the rest of the good stuff here. Um, with these frameworks, and I've done these, I've done hundreds of these studies. 
it's important that your framework is reusable. You don't want to have to go back to the users again and again. Um, so we want to be able to then adjust our findings and framework based upon changes to the organization, the industry, risks, new direction, also other digital technologies we may want to assess. So we want to be able to have a flexible plan that we can go back to and retool. So that's it. Hopefully we're at 10 minutes. Uh, as a follow-on to the presentation, I'm providing a copy of the checklist to you and also a two-minute video discussing why business process focused digital transformation is important. So you can share that. And for you attendees, I'm really happy to provide a free consultation to you to discuss what are your process improvement goals, what are the digital technologies you're looking at, giving you some ideas and feedback, uh, and to provide some ideas. And I'm happy to do that. So my phone number is here. Um, also, as I mentioned, as independent consultants, we don't sell or resell the hardware or software, so we can provide you with an objective voice regarding how to plan and, and what can these technologies really do. Now it's time for questions and answers. Well, that is George Dunn. And George, I believe you are joining us for a live Q&A. George, are you with us? I am, and thanks for the courtesy of doing the video. I'm here in the U.S. Virgin Islands, so I wasn't sure about internet speed. So you know, I, life's tough for some folks, right? I hate. I think, we, we're, I think we, we're okay for the Q&A. We hate to bother your day in the Virgin Islands today, George. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Now, um, I really love the, the, the way that you've outlined a, a roadmap for a digital transformation plan. A lot of AIM members, well, many, almost every time I interview an AIM member, a practitioner for the podcast, or we do our research here, the consistent feedback is that practitioners struggle to get the sort of buy-in and support that they need from uh, the C-suite for digital transformation initiatives. How do I convince my organization of the need to actually develop a plan for digital transformation? Well, I think it to start is, let's try to figure out where we're gonna get the biggest benefit for this technology. We know it's exciting technology. So I, I think it starts with showing them a glimpse of the technology. What could AI do? What can digital workflow do? And then say, we'd like to take an approach where we identify our highest value areas so we can, we can uh, allocate our time and dollars correctly. And we also wanna get our users excited. And by having um, an internal consultant that's skilled to do this or an external consultant, um, it'll generate excitement, generate acceptance. The employees become part of this plan so I think if we give them a little taste of the technology and then say, let's, let's do an assessment of our top processes. And you know, Kevin, it doesn't take that long to do one of these studies. It, it's really pretty quick. Um, I think that's a good way to start. Do you find, or do you recommend that folks do at least maybe a preliminary plan, have something codified so that then when they do advocate for action at the C level, that is a tool that helps build credibility and buy-in? Is that a tech that you find successful? Yeah, and I think it's two components. One is you have to plan to plan and just outlining what an approach would be. And we've got a, a checklist that's been provided as part of this presentation. What do I know? I've done hundreds of these studies and done this for the past 25, 30 years. And so part of this is, this is what I have learned because when I first started, they'd have me jump into a particular project. Let's look at AP, let's do this, let's do that. But I found that, once that first project was done, the organization started to lose focus. So I learned myself mm -hmm. that by talking about, and, and sometimes maybe it is one process we'll focus on, we'll, we'll do the step two of the checklist. We'll drill down and do current state and future state. But by saying, look, let's, let's take a little more holistic approach to this. It doesn't take that much time to do it. Then we have all the cards on the table from the user groups. We know where they're excited. We know where the benefit is. And it makes it a lot easier. So I think it's two components, Kevin. One is a short plan on how to plan and what the benefits are. Um, and then by doing the plan, coming up with that, that high-powered multi-year roadmap that is just so beneficial to get the budgets needed to successfully complete these projects. All right. I've got a plan. I've got some support. What is the role of citizen developers in moving forward? Well, you know, it's an exciting concept. You know, we see, especially with robotic process automation, which I, I presented on at the last conference that, you know, the users have got all kinds of neat ideas. And so I think I would like to do a twist on it and say we citizen developers are people that might set up 
different simple apps, no code apps um, and exchange information. But I would say to expand that be citizen designers and let's have that conversation first. Mm -hmm. um, but innovation today is happening in both, both directions. You know, perhaps for those cross-functional processes, departmental processes that are real high ROI, we're gonna do the plan. But perhaps for individual repeatable processes that are unique to the user, let's give them the tools to start to do some innovation with low code like RPA and then exchange information ideas and then we can grow from there. So I think it's kind of technology based and, and a combination of the two, but we don't wanna have citizen developers trying to develop you know, huge systems. That's not their job. They're busy doing their own work. So I think we, we kind of wanna look at both as we develop the plan. How do I sustain improvements? Maybe, as you mentioned, we've done some work in maybe a limited scope or a limited process sort of focus. How do that, I then replicate that, uh, those improvements, those innovations across the organization, maybe in other areas that are not connected? That, how do I uh, build that sort of momentum moving forward? Well, I think it's two ways, Kevin. The first is uh, whoever's working with your organization needs to teach as they're doing the work and coach so that your internal staff, and I knock on doors, I want IT there, I want the chief to drop in every second or third meeting um, and be part of this process. So as people become skilled, your internal folks, they can then utilize this, also creating a standard approach to how you blueprint your processes. So you have standard operating procedures that have the same look and feel. So it's, I think, understanding the tools and the methods give you a real fantastic opportunity to reduplicate the results. The other is to measure results and share results. I had situations where one or two of the uh, directors were not on board, but with, by the time the project was, was done, they were the evangelists going to the other department saying, this is how we did our planning. This is how we decided where to focus. This is how we crafted the design. And that excitement is just fantastic. So mm. I think it's focusing on that because how are you going to put digital workflow together for AP is going to look different than onboarding and a combination of digital transformation, AI and RPA for a compliance process. So they're all going to look different. So, but if you can standardize tools, knowledge and approach, which then of course feeds into the plan, then you're supercharged. We have a, a question coming in from Nadia, uh, Nadia Corbin Babb. Thank you, Nadia, for your question. And please feel free, rest, uh, everyone, to enter questions into the Q&A. But Nadia asks, how do you address end users who are enthusiastic about digital transformation and automation, but are insistent on simply replicating their processes into an automated process, even though it isn't streamlined or efficient. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, don't change my, uh, don't call my baby ugly. What, what advice do you have for Nadia? Well, I think it, I start with, I don't use words like six sigma or lean. I just say, you know, I think that's great. How about, so we can figure out <clears throat> how to program it. Can we just spend some time talking about your current process? Just so we understand how you'd like this thing to function. And I start with a baseline <clears throat> and you know, it could be one page could be three pages, you know, and then I'll say, well, what's stressing you out in this process? And they'll say, you know, this stresses me out or this does, or this is an unhappy path. So by doing a baseline on the premise that we want to understand how it works today so we can automate it the way they'd like to, it then leads naturally, organically to a redesign. Because then we might say, or this, you know, can we cut off, cut out some of the steps? Yeah, you know, checkers checking the checkers. And can we do this a little bit differently before we automate? You just, so you, you do it gently and you engage and all of a sudden the light bulbs come on and the users are like, wow, you know, this, this is good. And so they, they put their comments in. And I've seen this not only internally with um, users, but as customers reach out to their clients and show them how they're going to interact, interact differently with them and say, what's your, what's your thought on this? Or vendors, people love it. And so it's, it's kind of doing that gentle approach, kind, kinder, gentler process improvement. Um, and um, even if the redesign isn't perfect, it may not have everything. You, you will start the journey of cleaning the process up. All right, very good. That is George Dunn, president of Create Independent Consultants. George, thank you so much for being part of our event today. You bet. Thanks for uh, asking me to join you. Appreciate it.
All right, very good. Let's move along. Our next presenter is Paul Shu. Paul, are you with us? I sure am. I see you coming in. Hello, Paul. Thank you so much for joining us today. Paul Shu is with us today, Director of Product Marketing for Nintex, talking about empowering employees and delighting customers with process management and automation. That sounds great, Paul. How do we do it? Oh my gosh, we do it by magically sprinkle some some fairy dust in the air. I'm just kidding. Just, Thank you yeah, so and, much. You know, swing the rubber <laughs> chicken. That's right. Okay. You bet. You bet. And if I were in Virgin Islands, it would be even better. So <laughs> correct. But alas, I'm not. Well, all right. But I'm sure you have more for us. Go ahead. Take it away, Paul. Thank you so much. Thanks, George. And thanks, AIM, for having me here today. Um, and, and of course, thank you, everybody uh, who's on this webinar and this event to, to listen to some of the great speakers that uh, um, came before me and who will be talking after me as well. It's always great to be able to share knowledge around digital transformation through process management automation. Uh, like George uh, said, my name is Paul Shu, and I am part of the product marketing team here at Nintex. Now, for those of you who may not be as familiar with Nintex, we believe in the power of process management and process automation, which can help improve the way you work. Now, normally we would have this type of conference in a physical location where uh, you know I sort of crave that um, a little bit, where I can see all of your faces and chat with you all after the session. But of course, times are a little different now. And after a year and a half, I think we're all getting a little bit more used to remote work while balancing life at home. And this is also why the time is ripe for us to really think about how we can empower employees and delight our customers with digital transformation, which is, of course, our topic for uh, today. So let's get right in. Let me then slides. Um, so now we know before, you know, COVID had affected us all. Think back to 2019, 2018, 2017 even, right? Companies have already been under immense pressure to change, to digitally transform, to be more efficient, more productive. You know, COVID kind of accelerated that desire and in a way added even more pressure for companies to adapt, to be agile. Companies are asked to improve efficiency in their business processes through digital transformation. Now, what I mean here when I say digital transformation is the leveraging of digital technologies to turn a business process more efficient and more effective. And this mindset is actually catching on and a critical focus area for many organizations out there because of a need to reduce cost, to satisfy their compliance regulation, and to increase overall productivity. But interestingly, though, you know, why is it so hard to digitally transform? Um, believe it or not, process management automation capabilities have existed for more than two decades at this point. So really the question is, despite efforts to digitally transform, most companies are still heavily relying on manual processes, right? Often using paper, email, and spreadsheets. Why is that? Um, well, after engaging with thousands of customers, the reasons, you know, really can be boiled down to three things. Number one, the lack of visibility, right? They lack visibility into these core manual business processes. And without understanding your processes, it is difficult to actually automate them, right? So, so George kind of touched on it uh, a, a, a before me, which is right, what's your end state, what's your current state looking like, right? So you have to actually understand what your business process um, here is. The issue though, is that companies often document processes in silos. And if they, you know, if they document at all, and we still talk to customers that literally would write down their processes on pieces of paper, hole punch those papers and put them in a binder, tucked away in a basement somewhere. So that lack of visibility is very, very real. Second one, a lot of automation technology historically available was targeted at helping developers be more productive. Again, we talked a little bit about citizen developer in the previous session, writing codes, right? Um, for, for those heavy dev centric personnel. But the problem is that it only answers the needs of the most complex processes. Resources within a business to build complex automation solution tends to be non-existent. Again, using what we talked about in the previous session, by, uh, with George, you don't want citizen developers to go and create these 
these massive, you know, mainframes and, and system integrations and, and migrations. It just doesn't make sense. Now, number three, many of the tools available are too lightweight and they lack the capability and power, sort of relegating their usage to only the most simple processes. So after two decades, it's no surprise that we still find a lot of these unautomated manual processes seeping through a lot of the organizations that we talk to. So a little bit of a, a pitch, you know, what makes us different, right? What differentiates us? Well, we sort of take a different approach to process management automation. If you look at the traditional approach to process mapping, it's often siloed. Again, it's not uncommon to find documents in a physical binder tucked away in the shelf collecting dust. Our approach is that process mapping should be easy, accessible to all, and dynamic. It should be a collaborative process between IT and business professionals and should be kept up to date. When it comes to automation, traditional approach has been much more developer-centric, as I said before, but as we see more organizations democratizing what used to be developers' responsibility, we, we you know, sort of believe in arming business professionals with the tools to start automating processes. And two really important metrics we also look at is time to value and ROI. With traditional approach, because of how dev-centric a project is, it's often a much longer project, which means slower time to value. These projects could get into the months and year-long range, right? And they're also quite expensive given the need of, you know, for consulting or for implementation. Again, none of that is bad depending on the project. But here at Nintex, we believe in faster time to value and high ROI. We don't want your process management automation project to be six months long. We want you to get started in days, if not weeks. So by significantly reducing the time it gets you up to speed, you can start to manage more projects and help you achieve higher ROI. So with all that said, how do we accomplish this, right? And there are... Um, there's a very specific way that we, we sort of think about it. And starting off, we always think about what do you currently already have in your organization? There are often hundreds, um, if not thousands of business systems and applications that power enterprises today. The challenge though, is that while there is incredibly powerful data found in each of them, connecting them together with the people who need to get mission critical work done is actually quite difficult. This is really where Nintex comes in. First, you need to document how your processes are, are, you know, are actually being conducted. And this is best document, documented by those who are on the ground doing the work. And this is where Nintex ProMap process management comes in, empowering employees to capture what they do and collaborate with others to ensure that resulting documentation is consistently up to date and that suggestions for improving them are routed to those who can make those necessary changes. Um, note that one of the one of the common themes you're going to hear is that we don't require any code to writing, right? All you need to do is type down the process you follow and create the necessary flow chart, or you do a drag and drop of, on our designers so that you don't again don't have to write any codes. Now, after you know what your processes are and how they're being conducted. It's time to automate them, right? We provide a variety of automation capabilities in this bucket and sort of, I, I, I love the phrase, nails need hammer and screws need screwdrivers, right? Depending on your unique situation, you may need a robotic process automation while other, other times you may need a workflow and digital forms. We also have document generation capability and digital signatures to help you improve the way that you work. But we also know that this is not the end of our process quest, right? Processes change, bottlenecks are uncovered and optimization potentials are revealed. We provide advanced process level reporting, noting how the processes are running and how they can actually be streamlined. And fundamental to all of this is the ability to connect to your existing business applications that you're running in your organization. So there is no rip and replace needed, but rather we help you extract even more value out of existing investment with process automation. Now, I'm not gonna to spend too much time on the slide. You know, we have more than really 10,000 companies across the globe, uh, including many of the world's leading brands. But what I would say is many of these leverage Nintex for thousands of processes um, and our largest customers is tens of thousands of processes are automated leveraging Nintex. So that's really, really cool. Um, but just to illustrate, because we have a horizontal platform that cuts across any industry and function, 
we begin to find fascinating use cases that our customers have used Nintex to manage, automate, and optimize their business processes with. And of course, you know, I can't boil the ocean. So what's on the slide is just a few of the common examples by function where Nintex is leveraged. Um, oftentimes what we see is customers start with one process in a department and then quickly automate additional processes across the organization. Now, I always love to bring in a case study um, to talk about. Um, in, in this case, I love the one that we did with Zoom Video Communications, the same company we're using to broadcast today's webinar with. Uh, Zoom Video Communications, of course, provides cloud-based video and web conferencing, as we all have come to know um, of over the last year. Now, with the onset of the pandemic and most businesses requiring staff to work from home, Zoom was actually immediately faced with the kind of problem that every business wants to have, which is growing super fast over the last 18 months and having too much business on hand too quickly. Again, great problem to have, right? So Zoom saw the total active daily meetings participants soar 30x in four months with a 354% increase of customers with more than 10 employees compared to the year prior. And additionally, they saw new orders jump fivefold. Again, great problems to have. Now, the issue though is processing and tracking those new orders uh, to the point of provisioning had been a challenge for Zoom, so much so that internally they called it the Zoom boom. Um, and with that surge, managing new orders looked to become a hugely expensive process. If sort of if it even could be managed in some traditional way, right? And the bottleneck was a set of manual processes based on emails and spreadsheets. So months before the pandemic, Zoom had moved to a combination of Zendesk for order tracking and Salesforce for order management. And it was a big step in the right direction, but still required the Zoom personnel to handle each order six or more times, including follow-ups. And just it's just way too much work for, for the team and way too much manual work. Um, so what Zoom ended up doing was work with a Nintex Premier partner to design and deploy a solution on Nintex Workflow Cloud, which is our process automation platform. And when the new order is entered in Zen Zendesk, it triggers the workflow, which automates all interaction between Zendesk and Salesforce. As the business process moves from new order to provision order, the Nintex workflow updates all of the systems, automates reminders to the sales team to create partner-specific purchase orders, and then sends a notification of status updates to the channel operations, sales, and provision teams. Um, the entire workflow handles 90% of orders and sends 100% of all of the confirmation emails. And as a result, Zoom is handling a 5x increase in their channel business and doing so more efficiently and cost effectively than ever before. They've lowered costs by reducing contract staff by a third and have dramatically improved their competitiveness through business efficiency, as well as really, uh, you know, honestly having a stellar pro uh, product as we know. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail on, on all of this. Zoom is not, you know, the only success we've seen. We've seen a, a number of successes in different industries and different functions. I put four here um, to, to kind of go through. BM Builder is a construction company that has a strong foothold in the state of Washington. And it was in response to COVID-19, the states, including both California and Washington, issued stay-at-home orders for all non-essential workers, right? And construction companies are considered essential, though, and needed to keep jobs side open as they are um, um, as, as they're uh, deemed appropriate by the CDC and based on their recommendations during COVID they created a check-in form for contact tracing. What's really cool though is that they spun this up in literally 24 hours. Um, Land's End, um, uh, obviously known for their tailored and uh, sort of business casual logo apparel for office wear and company events, they needed a better way to streamline their custom orders, which is eating up their productivity. Their old custom order uh, form was manual, phone calls coming in, emails coming in left, right, and center from clients, and you know, with custom order details all over the place. And it was estimated that it takes up to six to eight week process to deliver custom orders. And when the order isn't quite right, 
start over again, right? And that's when they turn to Nintex to deliver a much more automated methodology. Now, when a customer calls their service center with a special order, their consultant records the customer order using the uh, Nintex form, which kicks off the transmission of a customer order sizing form to the customer. Then that form is sent to um, the manufacturer for production. And once it's done, sent to Lens End, approved by staff and then routed to a vendor for, um, for, uh, for delivery. All of this is actually automated and every step of the way is timestamped. Again, won't go into uh, so much de detail, just uh, given time constraint, but you know, National Gallery of Singapore, they implemented a new visitor registration form during COVID. And that was spun up in three days. Um, on the bottom right, Red River Bank, um, they processed more than 1400 applications during uh, the height of COVID, helping local businesses get close to $200 million worth of loans. And that was created in 36 hours. So one thing you're going to notice across the board is just how fast companies can get started with the Nintex platform. Again, it's that time to value, right? The fast time to value and high ROI that we really want you to experience. And we believe by democratizing process management automation to everyone in the company, not just for IT professionals, you can accelerate your digital transformation initiatives. And um, you can find a lot more of these stories on nintex.com. But these are really just a subset of, of what we see, we've see. we been able to see companies do with um, our Nintex platform. So as a next step, I encourage you to learn more. Uh, visit our website, nintex.com. You can sign up for a trial. You can sign up for a demo with us and, and really start to experience the true power of process management and automation. Of course, if you would ever need to or would love to talk a little bit, little bit more about process management automation, here's my email, um, also my LinkedIn uh, URL as well uh, to connect via uh, LinkedIn. So with that, thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. That is Paul Shu, Director of Product Marketing at Nintex. Paul, uh, what a great uh, bunch of examples, real world examples of how uh, organizations are applying process management um, and digital transformation. I see a lot of great savings, a lot of great uh, acceleration of, of transformation. In what ways can I use this approach to start gaining competitive advantage on my competitors? Yeah, no, that's that's a really good question. And I'll give you, I'll, I'll sort of give you uh, another real life example, public sector, um, government employees, right? We're in a way government um, organizations are the largest, largest organizations out there because every one of us right, pay taxes in, and essentially we're, we're customers of government um, organizations. And during the height of COVID, what they really had to do is really think about how do we improve the way that that you know the the citizen experience, right? So so again, you know, part of it was coupled with remote work, and part of it was social distancing. So you really have to start thinking about how do you improve that um, that old the traditional way of standing in, in line, but instead of that, but staying online. Right. So, so putting that into perspective, into thinking about creating more better customer experience or citizen experience, that's what a lot of public sector government organizations started to do, which is taking their manual forms, which we all know of, right, when you go into a DMV office or, or some other offices, you fill out manual forms, starting to put those online and then start to have workflow automation kick out, kick out um, the form into the necessary to this right stakeholders in the back end. While this may seem simple, this saves so much time and energy and productivity for organizations out there, both for commercial and um, public sector organizations. That's really where you can start to gain a competitive advantage because the point here is that if you're, if your workers do not have to spend as much time figuring out the mundanes, the repetitiveness of you know, copying data from one place to another. We talked about RPA uh, in the previous session. That is time that you get to spend on other strategic endeavors, right? So that's how, in, in my opinion, how you can start to gain a competitive advantage, which is that time saving now you can, that can be spent on, on other important initiatives that you have to always wanted to get to, but just didn't have enough time because you're always stuck in this mundane, repetitive uh, nature of work. Now, Paul, you mentioned in your presentation, um, both robotic process automation, RPA, and workflow automation. You mentioned yeah. that sometimes I might need RPA, sometimes I might need workflow, maybe both. Um, I'm a little unclear about the differences. When should I use things like RPA versus workflow automation? 
Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. And we have a lot of good um, experts on the call as well. But one, one simple way that I sort of think about between RPA or robotic process automation versus workflow automation is when you think about RPA, it's really uh, siloed to your desktop, right? It's your personal robot that is helping you out. So in a way, it's a very linear process. Um, when you think about it, it's more linear, more personalized process for you to to, uh, to automate. When I think about workflow automation, I usually think about, think about it from a total process orchestration standpoint. So if I have to interact with you, Kevin, and, and then with Teresa or, and with somebody else and emails need to send and, and be done with sentiment analysis using AI and based on that response, send it to my customer support for follow-up and then customer support needs to con uh, you know contact product teams for something. That is uh, sort of what I call a total process orchestration. That is really good uh, and, and better to be done with things like workflow automation. Robotic process automation, again, uh, a more singular focus, mm -hmm. a little bit more for yourself or individuals, whereas workflow automation is really designed for an entire organization from a total process orchestration standpoint. Very good. That is Paul Shu, Director of Product Marketing at Nintex. Paul, thank you for being part of our event today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. All right, let's move right along to our next presenter today, Matt Warda. Uh, Matt, are you with us? I am. Hello, Matt. It's great to have you with us today. Matt yes. Warda, Matt Warda is with us, pro, uh, program director at IBM Automation, here talking about intelligent work management. You'll discuss how we can create resiliency and, for, and advantages for our enterprise by expanding the access of application automation across the enterprise. Please, Matt, tell us more. Yes, thank you very much. So let me get uh, us up and running here. And can you see my uh, presentation? Yes, sir. Looking good. Looks like we're on the wrong slide, though. <laughs> From that perspective. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Pleasure to be here uh, for you today. As, as mentioned, I'm a program director within product management within IBM's automation division. I'm, I'm responsible for our, our workflow process automation capabilities, which span both our, our business process automation management, our case management, as well as our RPA. Uh, capabilities, um, all really looking at how do we solve the problem of work, right? And that's really what the challenge is that, you know, we just heard from before um, with COVID, all the challenges that we've had. And what we've seen is the studies that we've done in the companies that we've talked to, that there's really been a peak in the amount of work that's generated um, across organizations. And some studies that we've looked at um, and it's learned is like people are spending up to 12 to 14 hours a day. So work is increasing. So we have to figure out a way to actually manage that work so people can focus in on what's most important and also focus on how am I reaching and achieving the business outcomes that I want and not be impacted and get that resiliency of not being impacted by things that are completely out of our control with the whole pandemic and everything uh, that we've all talked about, right? And we're all well aware of, um, of what we've gone through recently there. But if we look on the left there, we look, there's multiple types of work, right? There's enterprise work, right? Which is end to end going across the orchestration of, of processes um, that are going between departments, cross-functional areas that are very business critical. And then there's expert work and there's repetitive work, right? So we want to look at where should we be spending our time and where can we automate that repetitive work, that administrative departmental work where we can and take advantage. So you're getting more throughput and value and time to value um, with the investments that you're making, both from automation and more importantly, the people that you have within your organization, at, at the, which are your employees that are can then focus in on improving your overall customer experiences there. So we were look at it as how do we apply automation at scale from both a process and robotic uh, perspective there to really address that problem. We've also been looking at, and we have been, if you've been following any things that have been in the news, uh, really looking at how does AI, artificial intelligence or machine learning really accelerate and provide us ability to automate more work in a consistent fashion um, so that we're getting predictable outcomes uh, on a day-to-day -day basis across an organization. And one of the researches that we did actually from 2019, which actually formed a lot of the features I'll be talking about today and capabilities that we have in our process automation uh, area is that just by using AI, for example, to prioritize work, 
um, at workers efficiency, we're all different at what we're best at, you can get about 21% increase in throughput um, of that overall team. So that's a lot of the benefits that you can get very quickly and easily. So when we look at process automation or what we can call intelligent workflow, I'm really focused on how we take it to that next level, right? And we've got six major themes on the right that are focused in on how do we maximize your performance, that resiliency and ability to absorb change so you can make changes quickly and you can affect the outcomes of each individual process um, to align to your goals so you're not getting negative outcomes that you've reported on and now, now what, now it's too late, right? I missed an SLA, but how can I actually get that visibility in near real time and then actually take action quickly uh, to actually prevent negative outcomes for my business, right? And at the end of the day, it is about eliminating non-value tasks and costs. It is about saving money, but it's also just as important to understand how do I improve my overall employee and customer experience? And that's why we have the key capabilities on the right that we've been investing in across our automation portfolio and program. Um, first is around business self-service. And, and this was just mentioned before, right? How do we get automation and process automation uh, within the hands of the whole organization, right? Depending on the type of work they want to automate, the types of processes, if they be personal, departmental, or enterprise quality, um, how do we do that? And how do we actually use AI to help you create that in a more quickly fashion that's still compliant and, and, and adhering to all your governance and compliance um, uh, requirements, right? So it's, it's fast, but safe. Right. We also look at using AI around not just around the completion of work, but how can we help you manage work? So really looking at that business manager, that team leader, and how can they spend more time on managing the exceptions of the situations that happen and less time I'm just trying to get what work needs to go where. There's a couple of studies that I've done personally and just read an article actually just the other week that said an average business manager or team leader spends anywhere between 20 and 40% of their time just prioritizing work and making sure that people are working on the right work at what time. So that's a lot of value you can harvest. You can free up that time again. We also look at, and we have in the, in the our capabilities around how do we use machine learning around decision execution, making simple decisions by providing guided approach. So it's not necessarily always about doing it, but actually assisting. So this actually assists end users in looking at previous decisions, looking at what they're working on and providing recommendations with the confidence level and what the actions they should take. And they can choose to take those actions or not. And that's all recorded. And then managers can choose to say, hey, you know what? I've got about 99% uh, confidence and about 100% compliance that what's being recommended is being followed. Let me just automate that task and no longer even give it to a human worker there. The other part is around hybrid workforce collaboration, right? We look at across an end-to-end -end business process, it's really about how do bots, digital workers, and humans work together, right? Not just about individual task automation, but work that task automation applies and the value it provides within the larger context of your overall business process and having bots and humans actually working within a team so that they can be assisted or they can be completely doing the work for a human. And so bots can ask humans for assistance and humans can ask bots for assistance where it makes sense at that perspective. And then how do I actually interact with my processes and how do I get better understanding of what's happening in real time, that visibility? Um, we provide natural language interaction to actually interact with your processes and your bots um, in a way that we all like to, to speak, right? Um, how do we do it? How can I ask you, hey, what, what's my performance for this process? What's going on within this division? And using it through a natural language and then getting those results in a visual fashion and replying to you to give you the time you need at time of need. Um, and then finally, which is to me, the, the, the real reason, right? It gets back to that visibility. You just heard that as well, right? How do I get the visibility, but not just visibility, but understanding of how my business is executing right now so I can take action. I, I'm going to probably talk about that a lot because it's a big part of, of the value of business process automation is the ability to understand and take action to affect outcomes, right? So we provide a set of no code business dashboards and really put the power within the business to understand what are the things they want to manage. We provide the ability to give them alerts, predictions. Um, you can put suggestions in there that based on a circumstance, a KPI violation, whatever, that here's what you should do to remedy that. And then the ability to go back and make that change within the systems in near real time to actually affect your overall outcome. So you can make sure you're aligning your performance to your overall business goals. And as those goals change, you can change your automations um, very quickly and easily to not align to those changing uh, outcomes that you're driving for. And I talked about before on giving it in the hands of everyone, right? And, and understanding that, that there are different qualities of automation and process complexity. So what we've done is we've taken the approach and looked across what we call our multi-persona approach, which is giving the right type of experience to be able to create work, right? So it's about the creation of work, 
the management of our work, and then the visibility and the continuous optimization of that work and those automations across your organization. So we have the workflow developer, which gives more of that you know, traditional developer experience, still no code, low code. The picture is the process, right? The ability to, to, to publish and create automation services, to be able to uh, look at a library of predefined templates and patterns that you've noticed with your organization that can be reused, but giving the, the level of depth and breadth of capability to work on your most complex processes. But then understanding that we also have departmental type work or work that we want to allow our business experts to own and maintain and manage that are important to them, but maybe not make it to the overall top priority of your overall organization's goals. So we have an experience for them so they can do that and create those things in collaboration with the workflow developer. So when they need help, they can reach out to them and they can provide those assets that they can use and configure within their end-to-end -end processes from there. We've also extended though, not just across that, but also to the business user at time of use. So when I'm actually working at my predictable work that was already already created and modeled and now it's running and I'm getting tasks and activities to do, but there's a situational or personal work or unpredictable work. We also have the capability by having predefined activity types that a business user can actually assemble and configure simple workflows for their own needs within series of minutes uh, that they can do to do, not have to get away from that email wrangling, right? It solves that problem of spreadsheets and emails and follow-ups. And I can do that within the same environment that I'm managing all my other work. And I can create these simple workflows that I can own, manage, and, and have visibility into and work completion. We also look at then how that works delivered to the end user. How do they manage that work for work completion? Again, we've infused this with AI. Uh, we call that our workplace, the one place to manage all of your work. Uh, we have the intelligent task prioritization, as I mentioned before, the ability to, if you can turn on at a manager's level for your team, and it'll actually reprioritize your work according to your overall goals, but also around workers' efficiency on who's best at doing what type of work, and then putting that work in front of them so they can just worry about completing the work and not trying to figure out what's the most important thing I need to do right now. That's also where we have our decision recommendations that we uh, previewed recently around, again, that, that what I mentioned previously about the ability to actually look at and get recommendations with the level of confidence on the actions you should take for work that's presented to you. And then finally, that, that, that business user ability to create what we call work streams very quickly and easily with a no-code configuration type of experience to create those simple workflows for their own personal productivity. Um, they can still manage within this one same uh, environment. Then moving on from there is really about that visibility, right? And, and like I said before, it's one of the, the areas that I think is the best benefit of any type of automation is now that I have that data flowing, I now have the ability to, to get a whole level of insights and continuous optimization improvements. I also have the ability to not only take the AI and ML that we ship as uh, self-managing ML models, but also the ability to extend AI within your organization because all this data is now available to you uh, from an event perspective. Um, we have the no code business dashboards, again, literally no code that I can go in in a series of minutes. And I'll show a quick little demo here of how this all comes together uh, around my processes, my case, my decisions and my content, right? So content is, is, is huge, right? To any type of automation that I need an enterprise content management quality, which is part of our workflow platform that I can actually manage not only the tasks and activities and digital information, but if there's other content in the form of documents, uh, recordings, voice, I can actually have that be managed within that flow as well. And we do that through a series of KPIs, charts, and reports, and again, enabled with AI. We also have what are called our workforce management focus within this uh, business performance center, as we refer to it. It gives us the ability to look at it really from a team perspective, really look at well, how is my, my hybrid workforce working? What's the throughput? What's the capacity, utilization rate, cycle time, worker efficiency, right? And really looking at it from a user's lens, right? So we have the ability to look at it from a process perspective, an activity perspective, and then from a user perspective, and really understand, am I best utilizing? utilizing all the resources I have available to me within the context of that process or case. And what are the changes I need to do by giving you that visibility real, real time and then allowing that to your business goals, which is on the right by having those goal-based business scorecards, right? Which is all around suggestions of how to stay in line with those goals, understanding what are the KPIs and how do those relate to the overall goals I have for the organization, the ability with predictions uh, supported with AI and machine learning to give you what's going to happen next week, next month, 
you know, next quarter comparative analysis and giving you alerts as well as when things are going a little bit off haywire, right? Because you're not going to spend, no one's going to spend their whole day looking at these dashboards, right? So how can I have an understanding of what's the most important things I need to work on right now? And if things are running great, who cares, right? I'm going to ignore that and focus on the things I need to get back in line and be able to take those actions quickly and easily with the previous things I just mentioned by having the, the, the user experiences that are best suited for that person that wants to make those changes um, from an end-to-end -end perspective, okay? So I'm going to go here and uh, just whip up a quick little three, I think three and a half minute demo and just kind of show you how that all comes together uh, from a user experience perspective. And it's really uh, that bottom table there. It's we're trying to answer the questions of, hey, how do I know what's happening now? What do I need to know? What do you suggest I do? What should I do? And what's the actions I can take? And what can I expect to happen next so I can keep my organization out of jeopardy? So this is a case of an HR manager um, played by me. Uh, where I've got a couple of goals, right? I'm looking at my, my new hire requisitions. I want to re reduce my time to offer. I want to increase my hirings per month because I want good um, uh, talent management and, and new, new blood within my organization there. And what I want is better visibility understanding. I want ability to, to track what's happening from a performance perspective. Since I'm the manager, I want to understand how my workers are performing any bottlenecks. And I want ability to take action within there. And that's what the platform really provides uh, from that perspective. So I'm just going to, for the sake of here, I've got a quick recording here. And as you can see, what we start out here is we have a model driven development. So if you can do Visios and uh, swim lanes and, and it's really about BPM business process modeling notation, I can quickly create that process. And that's what's running behind the scene here. What we're looking at now is our call our workplace that I mentioned before, where I can see my tasks and activities. I can go in and get some quick information. I can start that task and activity. I can also turn on the intelligent task prioritization that I mentioned for here. And you'll see as I click on that, um, my actual task changed the order and it's prioritizing that for what I, I'm best looking at. And as a manager, I would assume that I'm, I'm responsible for those approvals. So it makes sense that that's what I'm It's saying. The ML models are, are what you're best at uh, from that perspective there. Um, and I can see on the top there what's on track at risk overdue total tasks really focus in my time and if I click on those it'll actually reprioritize my task based on that. I can also look at it from an overall instance view of my cases my processes what are running what's the status of them overall from that perspective. I can also go in and look at my dashboard that's really gets into our performance. And if I click into there, I can actually get into an edit environment because I have permissions and I can actually start editing these tasks. So I can see from a KPI perspective how I'm doing over time with my uh, new hire requests per day and what my targets are. I can see how many have come in, what my average completion time is in a matter of days. And that's where we're looking at it from a process and activity perspective. But now I can look at it from a team perspective. Um, how many, what's my you know, number of open new requests coming across my teams? What's my completion rate across my teams? And how am I doing there? And what teams are maybe bottlenecks within there? And I can also see in this case how my robots are actually performing in the context of these other teams. And on the right here there that I'm highlighting is really around looking at it for a particular case type. What's my best performance? So I can see in this case, I got two bots, one called BPM admin and one bot one. And, and as expected, they're performing a little bit higher than everybody else. But this is looking at it from a heat map, from a comparative perspective and who's best at what over time and their completion rates. I should also look at this from an efficiency perspective uh, where it actually compares performance against one another across all task types that a team is working on there. And again, you can create these in, in literally minutes of any one of these views because it's pre-curated for you. I can also look at it from a trend analysis. Here's that prediction that I spoke about a little bit. I can then just click on that and it's gonna tell me, hey, here's what I'm expecting to happen over the next, you know, this week for the rain of this week. So you can kind of staff for that. I can look at it from my task average durations. So what's that really that, that long pole in the tent? Where, where's the problem I have of all the steps in my process? Uh, where am I taking my time? So let me just, you know, go and focus in on the two that were the highest around submit physician requests, which is like, hey, why is it taking someone so long to submit these requests? Maybe I need some UX improvement there. Or I can just look at it and say, well, find position candidates actually makes sense because it takes a long time to get that candidate list to send it out, get people to reply, and for me to create that list for there, from, from there. That's giving you that visibility. I just want to give you a quick little highlight of kind of like some of the capabilities and what that experience would be like there from kind of just everything you're seeing just comes out of the box. If it's managing my teams uh, from a manager's perspective, I can go in and do that. I can see how easy all the teams I manage. I can go into a team. I can see my users. I can then go in and choose a task and say, hey, I want to reassign this. I can change the priority. I can edit the due date of when it's actually due. And again, that's adjusting um, the performance to I can achieve a more optimal outcome because maybe I said, hey, this one's at risk or in jeopardy of being approved. So again, you got the low code modeling development, 
You've got the workplace where I can go and manage all my work and activities and my teams from both the end user perspective and a manager's perspective. And I get that rich insights that I can get at, the, at my fingertips in a matter of minutes um, to really make sure I'm controlling the outcomes of my organization. So hopefully that was a little bit useful. I always like to say, you know, it's good that slides are good, but it's good sometimes just to get a little bit of view. Um, so yeah, that's it. A couple examples of where we of, of customers and use cases we have just two here. One state of Tennessee, um, they looked at it really around their claims processing perspective and got about 77% improvement across their 135,000 claims uh, per year. I also really like about the Seoul Caribbean. Um, they have about a thousand projects and they're very manually driven. They were taking them weeks and weeks to complete. Uh, we got that down to about one week or less very quickly and easily so they can manage these thousands of projects uh, that really had a substantial um, impact to their overall uh, business right from from there and the real important thing about that was that it wasn't just about automation as well it was really about i need that auditability and that's one of the things you just get like with process automation everything i've shown is not only you're visualizing that but all that stored within a peer curated data lake that you can have for as long as you want you can export that out you can use it for machine learning ai development as well as the ability to audit um, from that perspective even from you know the ability to then put rules in there uh, for data protection, right? So data is important, but also we gotta make sure that data is safe. So we also provide the ability to um, basically take like PI, a sensitive data, and we can actually remove it uh, fr from that, that data lake. So no one can get visibility into it. We can actually obscure it. Um, so there's different, different options depending on your organizational needs and what we can do there from that perspective, okay? So to learn more, um, you can go to the IBM Automation to talk about our workflow content, AI capabilities, um, and our broader capabilities that we have within our automation portfolio. But again, from a business process automation perspective, we really look at how do we automate end-to-end -end business processes from individual departmental enterprise? How do we take best advantage of my human and digital labor working together within those processes? And really, we don't see that as really being separate. They really go hand in hand from, from, from there. And uh, my contact information. If you'd like to reach out, please do. Very good. That is Matt Warda, Program Director from IBM Automation. Matt, it has been great to hear your feedback today. You gave us some examples of, of HR hiring. You talked a little bit about claims. Uh, I guess I'm asking this to everyone today. How do these approaches, what are your recommendations for these approaches in ways that I can use to further the competitive advantage of my organization. Yeah, so I think it's been touched on a couple of different times here today. Um, one, it's about having uh, being very quickly and easily to understand what's happening through discovery so that I can get a quick understanding of where the opportunity lies for competitive advantage, right? If that be around task automation with maybe RPA standalone, if it be around really and, and process automation, or if it be a combination of both, as well as other automation technologies. I talked a lot about um, AI, right? So it also goes into aligning and making sure that, you know, not just automation for automation's sake, but that I have a clear business plan, right? Do I have a clear work management plan or workforce plan of how does digital labor affect my workforce? Do I have a clear plan on what the goals and objectives are for my automations so that I can quickly measure and tie back those savings to real um, quantifiable results, right? It also depends, and I answer this in ways, and I'll, I'll sum it up. Um, it also looks at, are you in a state of modernization or transformation, right? And I think that's the, the scale of where your automation capabilities lie. Um, modernization is great. It provides all the savings we have there. And then you look at, how do I then start look, moving into more of a transformational mode with, with kind of digital transformation? And it really depends on where you're at and what level you need to get to. So I always like to say it's, it's, it's about quickly understanding where you're at, where you want to be aligned to your goals and objectives and having the tools that are capable to not only identify that, but quickly affect and put that into um, action. Now, Matt, with putting more and more automation capabilities in the hands of business users, how can we assure that all of our content is secure? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. So when you apply automation, you have a lot of data flowing through there, right? So there's always the, the types of best practices, right? So one, there's a lot of data you have. There's probably not a lot of, not every process or automation requires all that data, right? So uh, first thing is I say, use the data that you need for only what you need, right? And I remember projects I was on, you know, for an enrollment for a financial company, new business enrollment, they have like 300 data elements. And when we got down to it, it was like really for 90% of the process, you need only 16 fields, right? So there's that analysis up front. Um, but then, you know, things happen, right? There's going to be sensitive information that's flowing. 
Um, from our perspective, it's making sure that if you're looking at applying automation, choose a technology or platform that one looks at security um, and compliance at the same level they do for ease of use, right? And we're all about ease of use and, and no code system development. We all have that now, right? That's not a differentiator anymore. We heard about the democratization before that. Um, I would say when we look at it, it's like, well, that we have that data, how do we have the policies and procedures and allow you to protect that data, be from encryption at rest, how do we protect it when it's in flight and making sure it's not getting in the wrong hands and making sure that you, you know the platforms you're looking at have all those rich security policies that are flexible and configurable for your own specific organizational needs, depending on what industry you're on. In. Very good. That is Matt Warda, Program Director, IBM Automation. Matt, thank you so much for being you, a part of our event today. Yes, thank you. As you mentioned, it is about time for us to start our afternoon session here. And uh, if I can just have the honor of introducing you, Kevin. Kevin Crane is a um, the the voice and the interview genius behind AIM on Air podcast, a program we've had here at AIM for a handful of years. And, and Kevin is expert at interviewing um, a variety of people as and talking about um, organizations on their digital transformation journeys. And so, uh, and in all the work that Kevin does with authoring eBooks and a number of other projects that we get to work on together here at AIM, I am pleased that he has pulled this presentation together to share with you all. Kevin, please take it from here. All right, well, thank you, Teresa. Let me share my screen and see if we can't get this party started. Um, all right, everyone seeing that? How am I looking, Teresa? Looking great. Thank you. All right. Well, great. Well, thank you, Teresa. And thank you, everyone, for hanging out with us for this afternoon part of the session today. It's my pleasure to be uh, kicking us off. We've talked about some of these uh, topics here. We've been circling around, uh, circling around these topics a bit. I'm here to talk about how to make a difference in your digital transformation efforts. How can you do it? Three areas that I think are really important to look at that you should be thinking about, your team should be talking about, and that is low code, robotic process automation, and APIs. Now, the reason that these are important is, if I can move my screen forward, is that according to our new Information Watch report, organizations are losing the battle against information overload, and we really start to need to rethink our approaches to content management and process improvement. Indeed, 46%, almost 50% of AIM members say that their organization is either doing a poor job or needs improvement when it comes to aligning business strategies and information management strategies. And I gotta tell you, this is a, I think should be a big wake up call for C-level executives, information management executives everywhere. Why do real world practitioners give their organization such a poor grade? A total of 66 say that it's things like a lack of budget, uh, a lack of resources, a lack of a plan, a lack of leadership, those are the kinds of things that are their biggest obstacles. And we could certainly go into the stats. Peggy did a great job of summarizing some of the stats that we found, but we have open-ended quotes from respondents in the survey as well. And, and just for example, quote, here's, here's one respondent. We can't acquire the tools that would help us with this chaos due to security constraints, budget limitations, and information silos. Another respondent said, our C-level still needs a lot of convincing to actually free up the resources that we need for intelligent information management initiatives. And one summed it up this way, rather frustrated, quote, our systems are just not keeping up with our business needs. Our IT infrastructure strategy is not in line with our business growth. To me, that says it all. And even though most organizations give lip service to things like digital transformation, using our information as critical assets. The reality is in, in the real world that most organizations find it difficult to map this sort of gentle, gentle, general sentiment into initiatives and projects that get approval, that get awareness, that move forward and are successful. So process improvement is actually encumbered by this condition, by the fact that many frontline users and practitioners struggle to get the support that they need, the focus that they need, the awareness that they need to affect real change. I hear it every day in my interviews with practitioners for the podcast and elsewhere. And often better solutions, better approaches are known. I mean, you folks tell me, um, but yet unrealized because of conflicting priorities and conflicting budget constraints. Um, 
does this sound familiar to you? Is this, is this something that you struggle with? I feel that frontline practitioners really do feel this disconnect. Many are looking to build that kind of credibility. And yet at the same time, C-suite executives also feel the disconnect. Certainly executives today are under great pressure to transform and they can be in the dark uh, when it comes to the importance of information governance, the importance of intelligent information management, what some of the, the possibilities are, uh, what some of the constraints are, what some of the impacts are, and they can struggle. Uh, the C-suite can struggle uh, kind of translating the jargon that we use um, in intelligent information management and translate that to their C-level uh, key process uh, indicators. And I think as practitioners that we may need to do a little better job also at um, speaking that language in terms of how what we do relates to those key performance indicators. But the result is that today in many organizations, there is an environment that despite all of our good intentions really does inhibit uh, process improvement. It stalls innovation and it costs the organization, not only in hard dollar terms, but in terms of the kinds of organizational performance um, and digital transformation that is needed. So again, I think this gap that we have uncovered in the new information watch should be a big wake up call. But really the question is, it's, it's not enough to talk about all the problems. It's now, what can we do to move forward? How can you bridge this gap? And that's what I'd like to talk about today. Three enabling technologies and approaches that I feel can make a difference. And it starts with, um, with low code. We talked a little bit about low code. We hear a lot about low code and no code. And why I get excited about this is this reason. In order to really make truly transformational change today happen, organizations need to unchain their change agents. We need to move away from sort of our outdated ways of working our outdated approaches to process improvement and work to streamline process improvement and encourage innovation um, and really make a mark in terms of uh, the kinds of agility um, and service and organizational performance that we need today in order to use digital transformation as a competitive advantage. Um, so, but what is low code? Now, a lot of folks are really familiar with this. There are experts on this uh, panel today that are much more uh, knowledgeable about low code than I am. But low code is a platform that provides a development environment used to create application software through a graphical user interface instead of traditional hand coding of computer programming. And this means that people like business users, citizen developers, IT professionals, people like you and me uh, can develop even complex content-driven mission critical business applications much more quickly um, by as much as 17 times more quickly, according to uh, some research that I saw on Forrester just recently, but even more importantly, perhaps in a more process connected way. And as a result, low code enables a higher level of organizational contribution by users and process owners and practitioners uh, than ever before. And I believe this is an important factor to leading to the kind of increased visibility and influence on organizational performance, getting a seat at the table, a higher level of C-suite credibility. Now, at the same time, a low code approach also reduces the burden for IT to provide that kind of customized support for innovation, maybe something outside of the purview of what they typically do as, as, as an IT support team. Um, and indeed, a growing number of IT professionals are favoring this kind of, uh, of approach. Um, nearly 30% of the IT professionals that we spoke to would prefer that process owners indeed have the ability to make their own automation and application decisions. Here's a quote from one IT pro that we talked to in the most recent survey. Quote, it, it would need, IT would need to be part of the, the discussion, certainly, but we need to work to a state where a process, a process change is not an IT change. And the more that we get there, meaning the more that we get to, to low code, the less IT needs to be involved. So that really excites me. You mean that I can do these complex applications with my business process owners, maybe someone like myself even, could move forward quickly, 17 times more quickly, uh, 
at much less cost, much less resources required. That's an exciting opportunity for me to build competitive advantage in ways to move more quickly than my competitors. But um, despite the advantages, many organizations have yet to kind of get on the low code train. Nearly 40% of the M member organizations that we spoke to do not currently utilize low code. And I think this is a huge opportunity and one that really can help our organizations get a competitive competitive advantage over our slower moving competitors um, and and close and, and, and work to overcome that gap between business and IT or information management technology um, strategies in, in really an enabling uh, uh, way of moving forward. So that's low code. One way, one area that I think you should be thinking about to move your organization forward productively, gaining a competitive advantage with process automation. Next is RP and bots, RPA and bots. Um, there is a lot of excitement and discussion about robotic process automation these days. We've heard it today and for good reason, robotic process automation really has the potential to build a great deal of process flexibility, response, service, all things that really move the needle and are distinguishing capabilities of digital transformation. As a result, business owners everywhere, all around the world, corporate executives are taking note. But, but what is RPA really? Um, and what are bots? Um, to apply RPA in the real world requires a number of important tools, but certainly this is this idea of bots. And while the idea of robotic process automation may seem like a, some sort of faraway future. The fact is that is, it is a proven technology that is at work every day, automating and streamlining a variety of processes and interactions. Uh, bots are bits of automated software that run often without the need for human intervention or perhaps alongside humans uh, being triggered when needed. I find this to be the most exciting and what we can expect in the future. Certainly, um, bots perform tasks that are both simple and super repetitive, maybe high volume, but they can also be used in highly complex processes that require many different inputs um, and, and different content and perform the process at a much higher rate with a much higher accuracy level than it would be possible to use using just people alone. Um, often deploying things like AI and machine learning. Um, it, it's a huge step forward, really, frankly, in an organization's ability to digitally transform and fundamentally influence the performance of the organization with higher levels of, of accuracy and efficiency and agility. Now, there are two types of bots to consider. Um, one kind are unattended bots, as I mentioned, that interact and operate without human intervention, they can be triggered by events, they can be put on a schedule, uh, back office activities, sort of things like um, inventory management, maybe supply chain logistics, these are all come to mind uh, uh, as processes that might benefit most from unattended bots. Um, and you can see the immediate advantages in terms of savings and speed, performance, uh, response. Attended bots, work alongside of humans and are useful when the end-to-end -end process can't be all automated, triggered by a human, by a person as needed. It's this bot-human approach that excites me the most um, and really works to, to digitally transform our organizations in ways that are super, super meaningful by offloading portions of the process for automation when needed and helping, say, me get work done faster. Uh, it's greatly useful in customer facing activities like marketing or sales um, or service and support. A, a, a call center uh, agent, for example, may get help from uh, an attended bot in real time during uh, a, a customer call, for example. So for most organizations, I think a combination of unintended bots and attended bots are going to be uh, maybe the best approach for optimal approach for applying intelligent automation. In the end, they are valuable tools for uh, process improvement and they really speed the pace of business. But again, almost 40% of the AIM member organizations that we spoke to say that RPA and bots are not on their radar. And again, I think this is a huge opportunity. The benefits are super clear and super um, 
available to us, cost savings, of course, fewer errors, increased customer satisfaction, and a consistency and a transparent of execution in the process that you simply cannot get. All of these things are, are hugely transformative, and I think um, ones that really uh, drive digital transformation in ways that create a competitive advantage. So that's number two, RPA and bots. All right, Kevin, what's number three? <laughs> and it's APIs, Application Programming Interfaces. Now, APIs maybe aren't as sexy um, as robotic process automation, but I think they're super, super important. And I'll tell you why. The amount of information that we must manage every day is just simply staggering. The, my writing for AIM and the research that we're conducting here all reflect this information overload happening today. We create roughly 2.5 quintillion bytes of data every day. On top of that, organizations on average have something like five distinct information uh, repositories or content databases, often with years of legacy data packed away. Um, and that's not counting the many file shares, the business applications, personal computers, thumb drives, you name it, that all contain often hidden or overlooked information. Indeed, according to our research, 49%, again, almost 50% of the organizations that we spoke to say that understanding, integrating all of this enterprise data and all the systems together is their biggest challenge to digital transformation. And then add to that the diversity of content or the, the emerging types of content, um, the new types of data that have never been in the scope of information governance before. One example that I'll point to can be heard in an interview I did on the AIM on Air podcast a while back with AIM member and practitioner, Regina Martin. She's a uh, records manager at the Howard County government uh, in Columbia, Maryland. And Regina, thank you for a great interview. She discussed um, the challenges of ingesting uh, audio files from police 911 calls. Now, Regina and her team, they re routinely scan a million pages of year, a year there at Howard County, and they pack it away in an ECM system. But now they're also challenged to manage gigabytes and gigabytes of audio files and potentially police body cam video footage. Um, how do they deal with that? They don't put that in the same place that they put their scans. So what is their strategy? From what I could tell, they're saving everything for forever, um, just in case. So it is those the, this sort of information explosion that makes APIs so uh, powerful and so exciting to me. And the reason is that our traditional notions of enterprise content management have, have generally assumed that you can manage all of your content in one place. But even the most modern ECM systems can become their own islands of information. And in reality, may only represent a sliver of the information that we really do need to contend with every day. Uh, so my question to us in the industry, is it really uh, realistic to expect a single source of truth? Isn't it more reasonable to expect uh, that records are really everywhere in reality. And if you come to that realization that records are everywhere, then, then now what? <laughs> and that's where APIs come in. I know it's been taking me a while to get to the idea of application programming interfaces. Now, these are pieces of software that are intermedi intermediaries between systems and applications and content. Um, when you log onto your phone or browse Facebook or um, book a flight, we're using APIs, many of them, but we just don't know it. And that's the point. Uh, it's, this, it's this fluidity, uh, this seamless and instant access to content and systems uh, that I'm getting at. Um, so these application programming interfaces, they define the interactions and allow uh, this interoperability in ways that open the world uh, of information and, and connect the dots, if you will, the silos of information. And I think are really, really valuable tools for process improvement that can be applied in all industries. They, they can indeed, uh, are indeed driving a new wave of innovations centered upon sharing services, sharing apps, sharing content much more fluidly. And in fact, it is this fluidity or what I call information agility uh, that, that I believe is part of an answer to the growing expectations of our customers at large. Customers, employees, even society, um, expectations are changing. Monolithic, complex, 
disconnected silos of information and workflow are really no longer tenable today. And organizations in all industries can use APIs uh, and their potential uh, to transform uh, their business processes, give new life to their, to their heritage legacy infrastructures and, and really make a difference by unlocking new business opportunities as a result. So APIs. So with all of that, what I'm getting at is that the business environment today is requiring a new set of, appro of approaches, new set of skills uh, to encourage innovation, unlock process improvement. We need to embrace 21st century approaches and not be locked into our last century mindsets, the last century sort of ways that we've been doing things. And I would ask you to consider these three ways to move the needles, um, the, to move the needle in terms of digital transformation and gain a competitive advantage. Low code, a super powerful tool for process improvement that enables uh, change agents and process owners. Bots uh, are super uh, powerful, again, for automating and streamlining uh, our key processes, working alongside humans and really getting the most out of the human uh, machine interactions and APIs that bridge the gaps between what we know are information silos and help us really deal with information overload in ways that make a big difference. So I hope that these three, uh, these three ways of looking at things may make a difference in your plans and strategies for digital transformation. How can you reach me? Well, I would like to encourage everyone to find me at the AIM On Air podcast. You can find the podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts today. We have great discussions with great thought leaders about these and many other subjects or just go to the AIM website and find it there at aim.org slash podcast. So with that, I'd like to thank you for having me today. Teresa, did I do well? <laughs> you did fabulously, Kevin. Oh, thank, you. thank you. My mom would be proud. All right. Well, thank you, Teresa. And um, so with that, I think it's time to move on to our next presenter this afternoon without any further ado. And that is Andrew Cohen. Uh, with ActiveNav. Andrew, I see you're with us today. How you doing, Andrew? I am doing fantastic. I will apologize for the shirt. I had ah. a tomato sandwich for lunch and it splattered all over my first shirt for today. No, I like the festive oh, nature the, of it. Well, on the holidays right, Andrew, today. <laughs> we, we are joined by Andrew Cohen, product owner of ActiveNav. And with an ever-growing amount of data to manage, as I mentioned, uh, it's important that we, uh, we, we look at automating content governance also. And you're talking about content governance with file analysis. That sounds interesting, Andrew. Tell us more. Absolutely. Um, so uh, as it says there on the screen, my name is Andrew Cowan. I'm the product owner for Discovery Center, one of the products that ActiveNav uh, offers to the marketplace. It's a file analysis tool. It um, in, interrogates repositories for file systems, looks at the metadata, looks at the content, and can report back all kinds of very interesting things about what that content is, uh, how valuable it is for the organization and what kinds of things you might wanna be able to do with that. Um, on the topic of automation, I so wish this was true. I wish I could just press a button and make it all happen, make the magic happen. Um, we are getting in that direction. I think a lot of the stuff that Kevin was talking about uh, in the last presentation really rings quite true to the things that we're hearing from our customers about how to manage these systems. They're, they're complicated, they're expansive. There's lots of people involved with uh, how to manage those systems and how can you make all of those moving parts work a little bit better together. Um, and one of those tools that you can use to do that is certainly um, automation uh, to make the processes uh, happen more smoothly, more predictably, um, and in a, a repeatable fashion that is uh, understandable to the users of the system, but the people who own the data, the people who use the data every day. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of uh, examples of where a file analysis tool can be used in an automated fashion to help with content governance. Um, that little picture there on the left is a little shout out to the folks from France. Today is Bastille Day. Um, and I love that picture because it reminds me of uh, a little bit of time I spent in France. And was that a Bastille Pit Day party? wasn't quite back in 1936 or whatever that was, but uh, it was a fantastic time. 
Uh, so automation examples, I'm going to talk about three of them. The first one, just talking about disposition of content, uh, finding things uh, and uh, understanding in an automated fashion, how you can uh, take care of that information, whether you need to um, dispose of it in particular ways or move it around in to particular the locations that it should be in, um, whether it's uh, something that you need to do for uh, data classification and labeling for compliance reasons, if you, you're doing that sort of thing in your organization. And then lastly, uh, being able to quarantine uh, information as it as it gets created in the organization and, and perhaps is stored in, in the wrong location or, or in an insecure location, making sure that it gets stored in in a location that is appropriate for the kinds of sensitivity that that, that information deserves. So I'm going to go through each one of those things, and you'll see sort of a pattern that kind of comes through with this when when I talk about it. Um, first off, the sort of the idea of of rot cleanup. So rot, uh, I think every here, buddy here, sort of knows what that is. Uh, redundant. Uh, uh, what's what's the R? I can never remember the R. Uh, redundant. Uh, uh, Obsolete and trivial. That's there we go. I say it so often, but I can never remember what the words are. Uh, taking that information that sort of clutters up inside the organization, the stuff that's not valuable to the organization anymore, the stuff that needs to be called for um, retention purposes, that needs to be disposed of in particular ways, um, being able to define what those policy rules are, where do those policy rules come from, and then what are you going to do about when you find that information? Sort of being able to reproduce that on a regular basis and do it on a on a continuously and and also in a continuous manner for uh, what uh, what your business, how your business evolves and how it changes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that kind of stuff for the rot stuff. Um, I love that picture of of Bob Braden. He's one of the architects of the interweb, uh, and I I just imagine that. So there's got to be files underneath those piles that are so so old they are no longer valuable to 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 him as a as 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 a as a knowledge worker and and how an automated system would be able to help tidy up his office a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing to do is to look at uh, what your your what what constitutes rot inside your organization, and this is as I'm sure you're all aware, a bit of a contentious issue, uh, coming up with what those rules are. There's probably uh, a lot that's written down in policies and procedures, maybe in, in inside legislation uh, for how you're supposed to handle this information, what constitutes redundant information, what constitutes obsolete information, what's trivial information, what needs to be retained for um, uh, retention uh, purposes, what has to be retained for records management, um, what can be disposed of and when it can be disposed of. Um, <laughs> with uh, Discovery Center, um, you can use our data classification uh, capabilities within the tool to define um, different types of, uh, of, of, of rot. Um, you can see here, there's quite a list of them. This is an example that we had from one of our customers who did a, a proof of concept about how to define what rot was for them. Uh, you can see down here, I've highlighted the very last one in there, so it's files that are older than 10 years and they, they, they want to just let us know what's out there that's older than 10 years old. That's down at the bottom of the list. It's probably the easiest one to define. All of the ones that are sort of above that are a little bit more uh, specific about how to define what they are. So ISO files, that's going to be based on the particular file type. Um, uh, there's going to be things, files that are really, really big, and you want to make sure that you're not hogging up uh, disk space and you want to remove that to save storage costs. You have temporary files, which again is the sort of files that are left over from uh, from systems that are, are not cleaning up after themselves, that kind of thing. So defining those kinds of policy rules about what, um, or taking those policy rules and defining them inside of the tool so that when you uh, perform some kind of a, uh, a scan of a particular repository, that you're getting a, a report based on those on, on what those rules are and then something that's usable for an, a, 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 either a, a, a records person, uh, an information, uh, information owner, a data owner, a business user, or, or even an IT person to be able to report that information so that you can see how that content is reflected back uh, in from your policy. So you can see in this rule, you've got lots of stuff that's older than 10 years old. There's most of the information in this repository is there. Um, one of the things about Discovery Center is you can run these rules over any kind of uh, repository system and across different repository systems at the same time. So maybe I'm aiming at a file system uh, for, in a particular place in a file system and a particular place inside of SharePoint Online because those are the two places that one particular business unit might use. You can aim these kinds of rules at 
that kind of um, area of interest, that specific business use case that you want to aim it to, not, not just in general across the whole organization. And then present this information back to the data owner, the IT systems, in order to do the next thing, which is to either action it or quarantine it, right? What are you going to do with this content? I know there's lots of questions about what that might be and when it might be, but to be able to take that information and then say, this is the action that I want to take on that on a regular basis. So run those scans regularly, so repeatable on a regular basis to produce that report and then automatically take the actions based on that information. So on a regular basis, going through, cleaning up, making sure you're not ending up with the same kind of desk that um, not only Bob Braden, but also myself have with piles of paper everywhere lying around. Those, <clears throat> that's sort of a, a helpful thing to run to keep yourself in a situation where the, the content is uh, uh, valuable to the organization that you don't have all this rot kind of lying around. You're continuously cleaning up after yourself. Um, the next step uh, is, is something that this, this, this thing that I wanted to talk about was the consistent data classification. In, in the land of Microsoft 365, there's a lot of people moving in that direction. There's a very valuable tool there called information protection, which allows for the addition of metadata and visual marks into content as it's stored in Microsoft 365 environment. Is also available outside those uh, locations as well, um, but that that information uh, metadata metadata tags that get added to that information to that content very powerful from a information governance perspective because all of the systems can then use that information to be able to execute the uh, the, um, the the controls, security controls, access controls, um, uh, storage controls retention controls within the M365 environment. So one of the things that we've been talking to our customers about is going through and looking at that content in much the same way we were looking for um, rot information, content that you don't need to keep around anymore. Now looking at that, at that the, the information that remains and saying, has this been uh, labeled properly from an MIP perspective? Looking at the content, looking for particular uh, types of information, different patterns, different locations, different users, all of that being turned into some kind of sensitivity label that is reflected in that, um, that MIP sensitivity label and applying those labels as you go along. One of the things that MIP does allow people to do is to be able to apply end users when they create content to apply labels, mislabeling information or putting sensitive information into the wrong location, which is the next thing that we're gonna look at um, is something that happens a lot when end users are, are playing around with the data, they're trying to get their job done. They're not necessarily thinking so much about what the information governance part of the part of the story is for the content that they create. So being able to go through and scan those repositories for particular content and make sure that the labeling happens consistently across the board for all of the different kinds of information that different types of users use within the organization. So being able to find that content, validate the label or set the label properly so that it's useful for the rest of the security controls that exist within the organization. It's a very valuable tool to keep that sort of level of security posture and information governance uh, at, at, a, at a high level for the organization. So automating that so that it happens on a recurring and regular basis. Um, this is just a very quick little slide. If you don't know what MIP is, um, this is a, a Word document um, where uh, the sensitivity label has been applied and it's gone and put a little header in there to tell you that it's confidential or something like that. That gets stored both in the visual parts and the, in, inside the metadata. And then things like CASBs and DLPs and SharePoint and other kinds of content management tools, content control tools can read that information and then apply their policies appropriately based on that label that's in there. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about um, was uh, quarantining information based on the sensitivity or the security requirements of the content. Um, so this is inside of Discovery Center or some other classification tool, or some sort of analysis tool to be able to look at the content and then set the sensitivity of that information. So to be able to go through and say, well, I found PII or I found confidential uh, financial information, or I found customer data, or I found intellectual property for my organization that's important, or I found uh, information that's, let's say, national security level type stuff or CUI or whatever it happens to be, to be able to scan that content um, and then apply those 
types of classification uh, in multi dimensions to that content because there might be multiple ways that you're looking at what that sensitivity means. It might mean sensitive from a PII perspective, but it also might mean sensitive from a national security or a CUI or, or an intellectual property perspective as well. So having a multi multi dimensional way of being able to identify that content and apply those particular classifications to those things. So using industry standard um, identifier, so looking for social security numbers, credit card numbers, uh, uh, in even things like templates for particular documents, if you're using templates in order to um, pull information into the organization and fill out those forms, be able to use those kinds of information about the content to be able to apply those classifications in an automated kind of way. Um, and then scanning that continuously so that you can have that information up and, and ready for the business owner. So you can say, uh, this information belongs to you and this is how it's being stored. And this is what kind of information that exists inside that. So you can do those just like those, uh, the report that I showed you before with re regards to Rod, but being able to show that to the content owners, the business owners, process owners, and tell them, this is the kind of information that's being created that belongs to you. Here's where it's being stored. Here's how it's being managed. So you can show that in a way that is a regular, repeatable uh, kind of a report that not only lets people, the business owners react to that content, finding things that shouldn't be there or should be there, but also being able to respond to that in a way that <laughs> allows them to look for what their baseline looks like. So how did it look last month? How does it look this month? Be able to show how that's trending across the organization. It's one of the things that um, businesses have a real challenge with is how we put this investment into content governance or information governance. How are we getting any kind of value out of that? How are we showing any progress on where we're getting with this program? So being able to do that on a regular basis, on a sustained basis to show we did it last month, we did it this month, we did it next month to show how that's going across uh, across time, how it is for particular businesses, particular locations, even particular repositories. You could aim at a repository and say, it used to have this much secret information. Now it only has this much. So going heading in the right direction or heading in the wrong direction, being able to do something about that. So you create these kinds of uh, identifiers for different kinds of information. I'm looking for broad information. I'm looking for data classification. I'm looking for where sensitive and, and, and secure information has to be stored in my organization. And you can do that with uh, these rules that I talked about and these processes for scanning for content and making these reports and then running those on a regular basis. So that gives you this sort of um, process of find the, find the content in the particular locations, run those rules around it, and then do the analysis and the reports and the disposition. What are you going to do about the content? Where is it going to go? The one part that's missing from this slide, because I wasn't really sure how to draw it in there, was to go back after you've done your anal your disposition the first time and then your analysis the second time to look at whether or not your rules and your processes are working for you. So I had that review part in that cycle. So not just the review on the process, but also the review on the whole thing to say, have I got my rules right? Do I need to change the content? Do I need to change what I'm looking for? Do I need to change what my rules are? Is it fitting the, the purposes of the organization to, 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 to protect and, and, and can, control the information that that best suits the business per, business goals you're trying to meet for your organization. So it's it's a cycle within a cycle uh, as you go through this kind of stuff. And that was me talking for a really long time. And I need to take a breath. Um, this is me. That's my email address. Uh, and uh, just for next steps, there's uh, a little data sheet up that we have up on our website that you can use to help you understand a little bit about some of the things I was talking about. How was that? Oh, that was great, Andrew. Thank you so much. That's Andrew Cohen with ActiveNav. Andrew, now look, you know, automating content governance um, is, is a super important uh, thing to be considering. Where is the balance between automation and manual processing um, in ongoing governance? Yeah, I think that I think the probably the most important thing is that everybody knows what's going on. Right. If you in, if you institute some automated processes and your IT guys aren't on board, your business owners aren't on board, and your end users aren't on board, they're going to rebel against that immediately. You have to bring them into that business process as you're building it so that you get the automation part as good as you can get it. It's never going to be 100%. It's never going to be perfect, 
that's the nature of computer systems. It doesn't change unless as your business progresses, as you bring in new people, new processes, new kinds of information, those automated systems have to be identified as well. So the, the manual piece kind of fills that gap in between those uh, times when you're doing a review of your process and what your automated rules look like. I think that's probably the best way to think about it. It's probably the most important thing to think about in that sort of balance between the two things. And when it comes to governance, I mean, um, you know, I've got work to do. I, it, governance <laughs> is not my focus, right? Um, and uh, rightly so. So what are some tips for sustaining classification efforts in the long run, whether automated or yeah. manual? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it has to be ingrained into um, the way people think about their jobs. Uh, it is, um, it's important that the individual people not only understand the thing that they're trying to get done, but also the value that it brings to the rest of the organization. I might be a tiny little cog in, 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 in the wheels and the machinery of the organization, but I'm certainly providing some kind of a value to the organization. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Um, so it also has to be about what is my responsibility to tell the organization about the value of this information? If I'm just, you know, throwing stuff into a big box and saying, okay, I'm done my work for the day, off you go. That's not very valuable to the organization. It has to be ingrained as part of the job. And that can be a real challenge to move those kinds of sticks along. The automation and the automated scanning and all that kind of stuff can sort of help to bring that to the fore in those reports that you give to the business owners, the process owners, and say, here's where you are. We need to talk about how we're going to manage this information and where our, where our gaps are in between and how do we change our processes, our training, our, our, our actual processes for doing the actual work and the, and the automated process and the storage and the IT systems. How do we move those things along as we, as we, as we try to raise that sensitivity of the management of the information, both from sensitive and, and, and compliance perspectives. All right, Andrew, I know we're running tight at time, but I can't let you go without asking you about the quickly changing compliance and privacy landscapes. What are some considerations when building automated processes for compliance, given how quickly the privacy landscape changes? <laughs> <laughs> you have to move at the speed of legislation, right? It's, <laughs> it's a real Which challenge. It's always fast. <laughs> <laughs> it's not always fast, but when it comes down and, you know, it's sort of, you have to, right. you have to really keep on board with it, right? That's, that's it. You have to have somebody in the organization who is challenged with, if you're dealing with this information, who has that as part of their responsibility. And I think it has to be fairly high up in the organization um, for those stakeholders to be able to invest in understanding that landscape and then making sure that as you see those changes coming down the pipe, as you see those, those uh, the, the, the emphasis on different kinds of information or new kinds of information, how you have to change your processes. So there has to be that part of that, that cycle that I was talking about for ensuring that your policies and your procedures are still in line with what your IT systems look like, what your business looks like, but also for how those uh, external impacts, the legislation, the policies, privacy policies, and all that kind of stuff affects it too. It all has to be part of a process that said, make sure that it keeps it up to date and, and considers those things. Get those, get those C-suite guys on board. You really need that, 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 that backing to, to make sure that you, you don't get yourself caught short when a new piece of legislation hits, hits your, your, your business. That is Andrew Cohen, product owner at ActiveNav. Andrew, thanks a lot for being part of our event today. More than welcome. Thank you. We are joined by Alex Lomakin, product manager at Iron Mountain, and he's here to talk about the future state of digital mailroom services. Alex, tell us more. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. I know we're a bit behind schedule, so I'm going to do my best to catch us up here. I hopefully win some points with Kevin and Teresa on that. Uh, my name is Alex Lamakin. I'm a product manager at Iron Mountain. Um, and today I have the pleasure to speaking with you all about digital mailroom. You know, in this session, I'd like to walk through the current state of digital mailroom. And more importantly, what the digital mailroom of the future looks like and how it plays a crucial part, you know, of the digital transformation journey that so many companies are on right now, especially with, you know, the events that took place last year and this year with COVID. We don't have a lot of time, so let's go ahead and, and get started. So one way that I like to view, you know, digital mailroom, you know, both past, present and future is through the lens of data transformation, right? Companies of all sizes are on a digital transformation journey and the digital mailroom really is the front door of this, right? It really plays a key role 
Um, paper mail, also known as data, you know, still comes in daily, and this data needs to be routed, opened, and ultimately put to work to drive business outcomes. You know, COVID-19 forced organizations around the globe to rethink daily routines. Offices were shut down, post was delayed, and this really had a, you know, a big impact all of a sudden for many different organizations. And it led us think, you know, to believe is how should organizations rethink their mail and incorporate it as part of their digital transformation journey? Now, it is true that physical mail is on the decline, um, but it's important to note it's not going away anytime soon. You know, we are still going to be getting mail tomorrow and we're still going to be getting mail a few years from now. Um, so companies need to be actively thinking about how they can become more efficient with their paper-based mail, um, because the data within this is a critical component to driving efficient business practices. So that being said, the sooner information becomes digital, the better. You know, digitized content can be used to drive workflows and increase performance, learn new insights, you know, you name it. And capturing data at the right time and making it actionable helps prevent missed opportunities or costly errors, or even worse, issues with regulatory bodies. Um, to understand, you know, where the digital mailroom of the future is going, I want to take a quick look at the current state of mailroom and then where we're going with it down the road. So where are we today with mailrooms and where can we go in the near future? You know, today the mailroom typically consists of physical mail um, that's all unstructured data. And this has a potential for very high risk. You know, the time it takes for mail to be sorted, distributed, and ultimately read, you know, can impact an organization's ability to operate effectively and efficiently. And worse off, delays in response times could lead to regulatory issues, or if the mail is not stored properly, you could also run into regulatory issues there as well. It's really not a fun project that anyone wants to take on, nor do they have time for. You know, unsorted mail or data that is not classified or has the data automatically extracted creates a bottleneck um, and can really hamper productivity and a lack of visibility in the organization. You know, as a product manager, I'm always out talking to customers and seeing, you know, what are their pain points and how can we improve those? And one of the things that comes up more often than not is I spend more time looking for information than I'm actually using it. You know, that's not anyone's idea of efficiency. And we need to mitigate this, right? So how can we do this? How can we take these, you know, older, more outdated, manual people-based processes and really bring them into the 21st century and beyond? Um, so one of the things that I'm working on is, you know, with technology and automation, right? So in the digital mail arm of the future, you know, mail is digitized, um, similar how it is today. You know, we take the physical mail, we scan it. But from there, then we want to, you know, remove as much of the human element as possible and run it through AI ML models to auto classify and auto extract the key data that the customer is looking for. This auto classification and auto extraction greatly reduces the resource footprint needed, um, typically found in a more legacy mailroom service. And then more importantly, it speeds up the process and ensures a quicker flow of data into the organization. Um, you know, on top of that, we can start doing things such as adding policy and retention to reduce risk. Um, what I want to do now is take a deeper look at the benefits of the next gen digital mailroom. So what are these benefits? You know, we learned in the previous slide um, that mail can be digitized and then auto classified and auto extracted. Um, models can be created to auto, you know, classify a document, tell you what document type it is, and then start extracting key metadata based on what that document type is. You know, this auto automation here greatly reduces um, you know, people in the loop doing the uh, work right now. And instead of taking those folks and having them physically scan the mail and physically look through and key in pieces of metadata, we can have technology do that and have people, you know, be more part of the QA process to do a, a check to make sure the technology is working as expected. Um, taking things a step further is, you know, once mail has been classified, we can start applying automatic policy and retention modules. You know, some documents that arrive from the mail need to be kept for a set period of time. Um, this could be both, you know, an internal company policy or external factors, depending on the industry or, you know, vertical that a company is in. Um, in the past, you know, we've seen policy and retention rules were often added as a follow-up step or worse, not at all. Um, this opens up huge areas of risk and issues with compliance, et cetera, um, can create a lot of headaches down the road. And, you know, like I mentioned earlier, no one has, has time for that. Um, what's nice is, you know, through AI ML and other technologies, you know, we can combat this, right? We can start applying policy and retention at the door as mail comes in, you know, which really reduces risk and time and can both, you know, save people time and money, two things that people, you know, never seem to have enough of. 
And then once this data has been processed, right, once it's been digitized, once it's been classified and extracted, the key is to provide, you know, secure access to the various teams within the organization. Um, you know, in years past, everyone's typically in the office or different office buildings. Um, that's not the case anymore. You know, look at this call right here today. I would argue most of us are remote. You know, I'm personally down in my basement office, but I still need the same level of access to all the you know, documents and assets that I had working in the office. So having a secure you know, cloud-based repository to store you know, all your data and keep things in a centralized repository is key. Um, and more often than not is making sure it's a simple UI, right? We don't wanna have you know, this crazy complicated system where no one actually knows how to use it. We wanted to make it easy to use easy to build um, and easy to implement and support. Um, and then lastly, you know, it's the ability to have multi-channel ingestion into this repository, right? We don't just want to have, you know, one repository for my mail and one repository for, you know, my HR documents and one for claims, et cetera. We want to have, you know, all these repositories linked together so you can have a connected and centralized view of your information. So on this slide here, I, I want to touch on, you know, what are the steps involved in a digital mailroom? Um, you know, and really, you know, how does it start with the mail arriving to ultimately, you know, data being pulled out of it? Um, so much like, you know, mail coming to someone's house or office, physical mail still is delivered. Um, you know, typically it's going to be delivered now to a scanning center um, where the mail is going to be physically opened, prepped, and then digitized. Um, from there, you know, what we want to do is you typically want to QA it to make sure that everything was digitized properly. And then from there, this is where the real magic can begin and where technology can really, you know, take the reins, um, you know, from what used to be a really, you know, human-based process. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, the mail can be run through AI ML models to extract it, auto-classify it, and then really put it to work. And that's where, you know, we need to focus on. Digitized mail and the associated metadata can then either be routed to the correct person, the correct team, the correct teams, or a system even, um, to ensure the right data is getting to the right place at the right time. You know, it could either kick off a workflow, trigger an alert in the system, or even spark a new learning. Um, and then once digitized, the paper mail can either be kept, um, you know, typically stored, or it can be destroyed depending on the nature of the document and any regulations, you know, again, either internal or external that one must adhere to. So, you know, what does this look like in practice? You know, we've talked about this, we've kind of seen some, you know, workflow and process slides, but what would an actual, you know, customer use case look like? So earlier this year, um, had the pleasure of working on a project with a major US insurance firm that was struggling to develop a digital mailroom solution that could be delivered in a timely fashion and then provide real world savings and value to them. Um, what happened with this company is they had a recent merger with another firm and they were faced with a major pain point of having a way to access their policy checking services. So what can we do? Well, we started out by first by rerouting the mail um, of all their PO boxes around the country to one central location um, versus having separate teams go up and pick it up across the country um, where the Iron Mountain teams, you know, pick up the mail, process it, you know, via the scanning and then use the AI, AI ML technology to actually do the auto classification and auto data extraction. Mail is then rerouted um, by approvals or exception processing workflows, and it provides, you know, a formal needs assessment and will ultimately collaborate it on the statement of work and leading to a successful project. Um, you know, for this customer, what they wanted to do is go digital as quickly as possible. So paper was essentially eliminated after it came in and everything was kept digital. Um, there was a couple of different document types that had to be stored, but the rest we actually learned that could be, you know, securely shredded and destroyed. So, you know, it also had some enhanced, you know, environmental benefits as well. And then this is just really just one example of how a digital mailroom can solve, you know, common business problems, improve chain of custody, have tighter SLAs, and then more importantly, cost reductions, typically, you know, in the form of less, um, you know, people-based resources doing manual physical work. So recommendation, you know, as a product manager, I'm always thinking about the future. Right. The current is important, but I want to always be thinking about, you know, what's next and what's coming down the pipe and how can the changes in technology, you know, that are coming at a rapid pace aid, you know, our customers in becoming more efficient and streamlined. Um, and how can we use, you know, the digitization and sharing of data to really improve collaboration with colleagues um, in an instant. Um, that being said, you know, paper still exists and it's going to exist tomorrow and it's going to exist the day after. So it's really important to consider, you know, a hybrid approach um, and having a way to bridge the, you know, digital world with the physical world um, to help enable companies to operate in a more cohesive manner.
So that is the um, you know, end of my content here on digital mailroom. You know, if folks are you know interested in learning more. Uh, we have some contact information here. You know, always open to answer an email or a quick phone call, etc. Um, and we also have a solution brief on the website here that is linked. That is Alex Lomakin, product manager at Iron Mountain. Alex, thank you so much. Now you Not gave a us a you gave us a great example. Um, and you've talked about a next generation digital mailroom. Can you take that a little bit further? And uh, how are organizations using a digital mailroom approach to, to gain competitive advantage in addition to the sorts of efficiencies and, and uh, savings that you're talking about? Yeah, great question. So one of the things that we've seen is the digital mailroom becomes one component, right? It's really the front door for that data, right? So right now there's a bunch of different avenues where data can come into an organization. Some content's born digitally, some content is born physically, other content, you know, is created internally, right? And there's so much data, you know, being created. I don't remember the exact statistic you mentioned. I think it was a few quintillion bytes created a day. Um, that's a lot of information. And where a digital mailroom can assist is creating, you know, almost clarity amongst all that noise. You know, most of the data that's created is important, but not all of it is. So having the ability to you know, filter out the noise and focus in on what is important um, can ultimately lead to a competitive advantage there. And that's where I see, you know, AIML technology really coming into play. Um, you know, auto classification, classifying the documents versus having, you know, people go through and say, this is an invoice, this is a resume, you know, you name it, right? Saves a bunch of time. And then actually pulling the information off that document, you know, looking at an invoice, this is, you know, the the invoice number, the date paid, the date not paid, instead of having someone in, you know, your billing department going in and, you know, capturing all that data manually and then moving on to the next invoice, we can have a system actually pull all that information. So your resources are actually spent, you know, chasing out for that vendor that hasn't paid you yet, or reaching out to that, you know, potential good employee that you want to hire next, instead of actually spending your time, you know, doing, you know, I don't want to call it the busy work, but really the busy work of the system. Now, Alex, how do I merge a digital mailroom with my current IT infrastructure? Another great question. So the best way to do this, there's a few ways to go through it, but I think it's also, Kevin, you touched on this earlier too, is through APIs, right? It's no surprise that everyone has, you know, tons of legacy systems, you know, whether it's a small mom and pop company or a large enterprise, you know, the IT infrastructure, infrastructure stack that folks have is immense. And you can't just come in and say, well, get rid of everything that you've had and we're going to start over brand new. You know, that's not realistic. So instead, you want to be flexible, right, and have, you know, new systems layer in and merge into those existing systems so they can communicate together and create that, you know, centralized view of information. Um, so that'd, that'd be one example. Now, I assume, do I have the ability to customize workflows? How does that work? Absolutely. Absolutely. So there's two ways I think about workflows. One is a canned workflow, right? For more simple tasks, you know, whether it's approval or routing or something like that, there's canned workflows that you can pick up, drop in and get to work with. Um, and that works for some use cases. The other, you know, area is we need to custom tailor something, right? We need to go through five different levels and approvals and trigger alerts and everything. And it sounds daunting at first. Um, and it used to be. Um, you know, now though, with low code workflows, um, as long as you can drag and drop, you know, on a, on a screen with a mouse, you're actually able to create and leverage, you know, workflows that fit your needs. Um, you can actually do it on the fly too. It's, it's pretty intuitive. Very good. That is Alex Lomakin, product manager at Iron Mountain. Alex, thank you so much for being part of our event today. Yeah, not a problem. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, very good. Well, that brings us to our last presenter today. Last but not least, Will Sellenrod. Are you with us? There you are, Will. Yes, hi. I am. Welcome, Will. Thank you so much for being with us today. We are joined by Will Sellenrod, Principal for Insurance Solutions at Pyramid Solutions. And you'll be talking about adding intelligent automation technology to BPM making our BPM environment smarter. Tell us more, Will. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Let's go ahead and jump in. Um, you know, I, I've been in BPM uh, market for quite a while. Uh, and historically, when we look at BPM, we would walk through someone's process, a day in the life of how someone completes their work. 
And we've come to realize over time and fast forward to today that business areas or lines of business really do know their current state. They know their existing process. It's the future state. And that kind of is where sometimes too much time is spent consulting. Some consultants spend too much time on current state. Some spend too much time on future state. Uh, and so basically what winds up happening is it's very subjective. It's based on the expertise of that particular consultant, but that's how things were done in the past. Um, typically we looked at BPM as orchestrating data between different systems uh, and identifying any kind of straight through pre-program processes. So there would be no manual intervention uh, that's historically how we looked at BPM deployments. Uh, they were very subjective uh, and they did some very basic behind the scenes tasks. And if we fast forward to today uh, and we start adding intelligent automation, what we're saying is take the basic BPM, which is now everybody's talking low code so the business become, can become more independent. Uh, we definitely support that but the business is still gonna need IT to move that BPM process through the different environments from uh, dev to test to uh, prod. So IT is still gonna be playing a role, but a, a more minimal role. But what we're doing is we're enhancing BPM by some of these latest tools. I'm gonna to talk a little bit about process mining. I'm gonna use a case study where we've actually got a video of a demonstration using RPA and AI. So I mentioned in the beginning of this slide where it's subjective to the consultant. And I think if you lined up three different consultants and they looked at your current process and your future state, you'd probably get three different uh, impressions of what was needed for a future state. And you know, one of the things that uh, we heard earlier today is the lack of priority for a lot of these BPM projects. And a lot of it is because there's just not a strong enough business case or the business case is too subjective to executive management to give it the green light. And what I like about process mining, and there are companies like Mayan Vineo, Salonis are two of the more popular ones, uh, is it act, it's actually software and it's capturing all the information on how work is being completed. So it's actually putting it into logs uh, and those logs are displaying what's really happening. So we're accurately getting all the metadata on a process through process mining. We eliminate a lot of the subjectivity and some would argue all of the subjectivity of the consultant. So regardless of the seniority or expertise of the consultant, you're gonna know exactly what the steps are to improve. So it's gonna point out, you know, how many times someone's logging into a particular system, data that they're entering, all that metadata can be analyzed and we can immediately go to those areas that are the bottlenecks. And it will also tell us through the AI that's in process mining, what the ROI is going to be. So now we have more factual data. So when you go to upper management, you can actually have a lot more confidence in what the success criteria is, but more important that you have a strong business case. So let's look at a, a PNC insurance company with approximately 50 customer service employees and um, customer contact uh, right now is a real hot area. Uh, this particular PNC insurance company they wanted to reduce their wait times. They wanted to increase the accuracy. They wanted people to be able to access their help or their support or their customer service via different uh, means like text, phone, email. And they also wanted to have the ability to immediately allow that user to have human interaction. And in some cases they want human interaction. So we're looking at the more mundane tasks that are human uh, handled currently today. And I'm going to jump in and show you this demo. This is actually a, uh, hopefully you can hear it. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to see a couple of ways you can transform your contact centers to reduce call volumes, increase response rates, and ultimately improve your customers' experiences.
we're going to show you how you can leverage automated chat response, automated text response, and lastly, intelligent interactive voice response. First capability I'm going to show you is automated chat response. We know automated chat is nothing new, but what's different about our chat capabilities are two things. Your customers can chat with you from anywhere, mobile, desktop, Facebook, Instagram, anywhere. And second difference is that our chat is powered by bots that actually perform the work needed to answer your customers' questions. Today, we'll play the role of an employee reaching out to obtain employment verification because they have started the process of buying a home. As you can see, we begin the chat with automated options presented to us. We have the option of clicking a button, or the user can type a response that your virtual agent will still recognize within context of the text. After identifying ourselves via email, the bot, like I mentioned before, is actually performing the work and not just routing us to another department. It is verifying my email, finding my information in the company's databases, creating the document and sending it to me all within just a couple of seconds. If a discrepancy happens, our virtual chat agents store the conversation for further reference if needed. Here you can see the complete conversation transcribed and stored. Now let's jump over to virtual agents who can text your customers in real time. As you can see, they are able to interact and respond to the customer or employees just as easily as chatting online. Your employee is able to start a chat by simply texting info and selecting their reason for contact from a customizable options list. After understanding the intent from your employee, the virtual agent verifies the person by texting an automated generated code and prompting the employee to retext to verify their identity. Once cleared, the virtual agent is able to create the employment verification and email it to them directly without the help of a human. Again, this is all done by the bot and it works behind the scenes to grab the information, in this case, a person's ID, and generate an employment verification document. Here you can see the email was sent and received. The third way you can transform your contact centers is with an IVR that again, performs the work rather than just routing it like traditional IVR solutions on the market today. For this, I'm going to have Eric Moore, one of our RPA experts, walk you through the demo. So here's what this demo will entail. I'm gonna put my phone on speakerphone and dial in Keep in mind that this is in debug mode, so it doesn't exactly reflect the real world. Uh, for one thing, I'll have to put in a code which a caller would never have to do. For another thing, it's gonna run much slower than it would in the real world, so just bear with it. The nice thing about debug mode though, is that you'll be able to see in real time, right here, what the bot is doing. Okay, let's get this thing going. Um, once I connect, I think I'm going to go for a verification of employment. Now, I could just tell it exactly what I want up front, but that makes for a short demo. So I think what I'm going to do is just mess with it for a little bit to show off some of its features, like how it handles things it shouldn't be helping the caller with and how it adapts to department choices, things like that. So with that being said, I'll get this going. Take the access code. You have reached the Shared Services Center. This call may be recorded for quality purposes. After the tone, you can ask for departments like HR, travel and expense, or accounting, or you can tell me exactly what you need help with. What can I help you with today? I'd like a good chili recipe. I heard you say I'd like a good chili recipe. I'm sorry, that isn't a valid choice. Please try saying something else. What can I help you with today? HR department. Tell me what you'd like help with. Some common HR choices are verification of employment, proof of first insurer, or retirement benefits. Verification of employment. Please wait while I send your verification of employment to the email address associated with your account. Your verification of employment has been sent. Would you like help with anything else? Yes, please. What else can I help you with? 
I want to talk to a real person. What's wrong? Don't you like talking to robots? Fine. I'll transfer you to a human. Have a good rest of your Friday and please hold for the next available carbon-based life form. Okay, so that's the end of the call. And as you can see, the email actually just showed up. And there's my verification of employment. Thanks to your friendly neighborhood RPA. So just in case there were any problems, we do have an audit log and the calls are all recorded and accessible in the web client. So everything you need is right here under this IVR call deal, call detail record. As you can see, here's the calling phone number less than a minute ago, and I can always download it and listen to it. So I know it says zero of zero, but uh, there is content there. So it just happens to be the server that I'm on, being the trial. Okay, thus concludes the demo. Okay, thanks, Eric. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the components that went into this solution. We've been hearing about a lot of different types of technologies. Uh, so it does include uh, BPM from a workflow standpoint, but we've enhanced the functionality with the uh, RPA, the interactive voice response, machine learning, and natural language processing. And these bots can definitely understand a caller's request and even email requested documents, as you saw in the demonstration, uh, and they can do that 24 seven. So in a lot of examples, we see that we can use the bots for more of the basic requests, like employment verification, tax documents, et cetera, and uh, have the humans do the more complex requests. And those can be easily accessed by the uh, customer by pushing a number on their phone, or we can even build that into uh, keywords, automatically move that uh, person to a human. The chatbot is software driven again. Uh, you saw the online chat conversation. Um, so it does interact with customers, understands their needs, and it does uh, mimic talking to a human. There are the uh, robotic desktop assistants, and they live on the agent's desktop, and they can be triggered to perform various tasks. So these are desktop assistants. So in some cases where what you saw were unattended bots doing the work, there was no human interaction, but now we can have human interaction and they can actually have the bots go out and gather all the information from different systems. So if you're jumping in between different systems minimized on your desktop, the bot can eliminate that. And also it can eliminate a lot of the complex uh, integration with APIs. We can do it much easier with a bot, but they can gather all that information and deliver it to the agent. And then we have BPM and that can support the structured workflows, which are the pre-programmed workflows as well as unstructured workflows where the worker is determining what kind of a workflow process uh, and that can be triggered by the bot. Uh, we can also do more unique things too uh, in terms of adding intelligence to BPM so that when a worker or in this case, a customer service, service agent has work in their in basket, we can actually have completed some of those tasks. So. If traditionally there are 10 tasks and I'm gonna make something up by adding a boat to someone's policy, if it's traditionally 10 tasks, we could probably use AI or some kind of business rule to complete maybe half of those tasks and just deliver the open tasks to the uh, worker or to the customer service agent to complete. And then there's also additional routing for second opinion, approvals, things like that. You know, one of the things I talked about in the beginning was using uh, process mining tools. Uh, and if you really want to get the attention of upper management, if you want to make this kind of initiative a priority, it starts with obviously having all the facts, 
And part of those facts are making sure that you understand what the ROI is. And ROI favors very big in a lot of executives' minds. And what is the achievable ROI? And with the process mining, we're finding that the ROI factor is much more achievable. Uh, and also what your success criteria is. Uh, maybe it's uh, reducing the amount of time to fulfill a customer request. Some of those may just be intangible. It's better customer service on the more traditional requests that are coming in. Um, so in this particular example, uh, we had a very significant ROI uh, and it definitely caught the attention of upper management. So that's pretty much it. Uh, I wanted to go kind of quickly through it. Um, this is a type of a solution that incorporates uh, a lot of the things you've heard today. It's intelligence added to BPM and we're applying uh, bots, we're applying RPA, we're applying business rules, we're applying AI, uh, a lot of different uh, types of technology to create a solution. And that solution is uh, increasing worker productivity, reducing costs and improving the efficiency. And more important in this example, the customer service uh, for a contact center. And it's not a rip and replace, it just augments the existing systems that are already in a customer service uh, department. So we're great listeners. Um, you know, send me an email if you have BPM deployed in a particular line of business. We're finding most businesses do at this point. Uh, even if it's just for a particular use case, but we're seeing it deployed uh, in almost every insurance or financial services company we're talking to. Um, but there's a lot more things we can do to make it more intelligent. We're not talking about ripping and replacing your existing BPM, but adding more automation uh, through more intelligent technologies that we just talked about. So I think I might've got done early. I'm not sure, but that wraps it up for me. That is Will Selenrod from Pyramid Solutions. Now, Will, you mentioned there at the end, um, the ROI calculations, 148% uh, uh, in the first year, up to over 300% in year five. I, I wanna understand how that is calculated. It says here, the calculation is based on burden labor costs. Um, and I can see that. Um, it, what are the ROIs or did this particular customer engagement, did they measure things like um, customer satisfaction or things that would drive new business? Uh, was it simply an ROI calculated on reducing headcount, for example? What are some of the factors that can bring me a benefit and gain competitive advantage using this approach? Yeah, this particular calculation was based on reducing headcount uh, somewhere around 65%, but it also increased the uh, touch time or reduced the amount of time for someone to get a response. And we found that a lot of people, like if they just want an insurance binder, they're fine with just pushing one on their phone to get it delivered to their email. They don't really need to have a long conversation with someone. If it's a complex claim that they're filing, we give them the option to opt out and talk to a human immediately. Uh, so we're seeing overall, uh, definitely the head count, but also an improvement in customer service. And that was part of the success criteria. Now, how long does it take to implement something like this to get all the automation up and running? Yeah, well, it somewhat depends on what's already in place. Do they already have BPM in place, as an example? Is it requiring BPM? Uh, you know, so I would say a minimum is probably um, three months to we've seen as long as six months. But uh, that's generally what we're seeing in terms of deployment time. Three to six months. I, I imagine there may need to be some sort of upfront um analysis and planning that goes into the implementation before we move forward? I mean, what's the approach that you take um, to apply the technology to 
say, an inefficient process that needs to be made better before we implement the automation? How, what are your, how do you advise clients in that case? Yeah, well, we have an initial session where we talk to a particular line of business. Like I said in the beginning, a lot of them know their process really well, and they can kind of guide us and say, these are the particular use cases that we find the most labor intensive, uh, and we can automatically start there. We also have some clients who are not totally sure, uh, in which case we can use a process mining tool and we can go in there and we can, you know, gather information in the logs, apply AI to it. Um, there's a variety of ways we can approach it. It really depends on, you know, uh, I guess what the objectives are of the customer, but it's extremely important that the success criteria is defined up front and the ROI is defined in terms of uh, what the expectations are of upper management and that uh, it can be delivered on so they can achieve those gains. We've seen a lot of management saying, okay, fine, we'll approve this, but we wanna see these numbers happen. So we wanna right. be accurate. Absolutely. You're yeah. gonna need those numbers and that ROI before even getting approval to move forward. I imagine that process mining tool can be really handy for that and uncovering mm -hmm. the gaps in the performance ahead of time and then building that justification. Yeah, we were talking to uh, a major bank and uh, this was for uh, loan origination. Uh, and she said, look, I know my processes. I don't need to pay a consultant to come in here and tell them what I already know, but I don't have the metadata from that process. But if you can give me the metadata and we can apply some AI to that metadata, she said, man, that would just open up a whole nother area in terms of automation that I could do that I'm just not aware of right now. And that metadata is absolutely critical for building that case and getting a seat at the table. If you are armed with that sort of intelligence, uh, you know your process, you know the metrics, you know the metadata, um, it's more likely that you'll get the support and funding that you need to move forward. Yeah, facts are better than conjecture, right? Right. All right. Well, very good. That is Will Selenrod, Principal Insurance Solutions at Pyramid Solutions. Will, thank you so much for being part of our event today. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Thank you for the invite. All right, everybody. That brings us to the closing segment of our event today. I will be asking to Teresa, asking for Teresa to, to rejoin us here and help us facilitate the end. But before uh, we get to that part, we would like to thank our underwriters of the event today, Active Nav. Fujitsu Computer Products of America, IBM, Iron Mountain, Nintex, Pyramid Solutions, and a contribution from Create Independent Consultants. We could not bring you these independent educational events without the support of our underwriters and contributors. So please uh, thank you to them and please do uh, check them out and give them some love along the way. Um, I do have a few notes on some key takeaways that uh, I just want to close with, I think that uh, we've had a really great session here today. Um, Peggy started us out uh, early this earlier this morning with an important look at the key uh, trends and findings of uh, some AIM research conducted over the last few months with AIM community members, revealing why and how um, AIM members and users are pursuing automation initiatives, what kinds of application and activities that are being targeted and how users are accomplishing this. And it really set the stage today for a great deal of discussion all around sort of the discussion about process automation for competitive advantage. Uh, Scott Francis from Fujitsu um, talked about scanning and scanning on the edge, sort of the next generation of scanning, distributed scanning, how to turn scanned paper into digital assets and giving us a history of, of over the last 30 years of, of scanning and it's, uh, evolution into a cloud-based document environment now. Um, George Dunn from Create um, talked about a process-focused approach to digital transformation that I think is super, super important. Uh, you got to have a plan, uh, not only to pre prevent scope creep, but also to get the budget and uh, the 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 support that you need. It's important to have a roadmap um, before you start improving processes, before you start applying uh, automation um, and hold everyone accountable to the deliverables and expectations. So George Dunn, I thought, really gave us a great uh, roadmap for all of that. Uh, Paul Shu at Nintex, I thought, was a great presentation. Business process management has traditionally been a term uh, 
reserved for IT pros, but really there's never been a better time to democratize business process management and automation that we've talked about to line of business employees and change agents. And by doing so, IT can spend more time on higher, more strategic projects while line of business workers really can begin to uh, automate their own business processes. I think that's a, a totally enabling um, way of working. Um, Andrew Cohen this afternoon at ActiveNav looked at three scenarios that can help automate information governance. And I think that is super important, especially with the automation or the information overload that we are experiencing along with the ever-changing uh, compliance and data privacy sec security uh, concerns and uh, regulations. Um, while IBM, uh, Matt Warda, he uh, discussed automation at scale enterprise-wide and really how to accelerate that. Um, looking at the advantages of uh, expanding across uh, the enterprise with automation. Um, Alex Lomakin um, from Iron Mountain today, I thought um, it was really here, interesting to hear about the next generation of a digital mailroom and, and how that can play. Look, if you're interested in uh, digital transformation, the mailroom is like the first place to look, right? Um, and I think uh, can be overlooked in maybe some of our other discussions about enterprise content management. Um, and then finally, Will Selenrod, um, just here just recently, uh, look, it ensure can improve your or decrease your wait time, improve your accuracy, uh, provide better access, uh, get that human interaction when is needed or get the bot sort of automated self-service uh, kind of action when you need it. I think you're really moving the needle in terms of digital transformation. We talked about some ROIs with just you know, headcount or redeploying people where they really matter most, but also in customer engagement. So a great discussion today. Uh, and I wanna thank everyone for being with us and bring back in um, Teresa Rezik now. Uh, Teresa, what are your thoughts and where do we go from here? Well, like you, I you took a lot of really good notes today. And, and, um, and as you probably saw in the chat, um, I provided a lot of resources from our contributors today. So please avail yourself of all of that. But one of the things that um, just like to remind folks that you know, turn to AIM as the resource for your researching and your learning, you know, Kevin and Peggy went in great gave great presentations based off of research that AIM has conducted. And, um, and we also mentioned, and I'm gonna flash this up on the screen, um, an ebook that Kevin and I worked on recently. So there's a lot of great resources that AIM has available to you and even our training and our communities. There's, there's so much uh, with AIM and so turn to us as a resource. But also you know, talk with the solution providers and you know, we heard from a lot of great folks today. They have a lot of knowledge and expertise and consultative expertise to share and help you. Kevin, what are some other thoughts that you have? Well, I, I'd just like to mention, look, we've gone through a lot of stuff today. When you go back to your place of business, how do you make a difference? I, I would challenge everyone to pick one thing we discussed today that was interesting or innovative or they hadn't thought about. Bring it back to your organization and look to how you can start discussing that with your team, your coworkers, your sponsors, your, your C-suite to really improve information management processes and practices. There was a lot of great ideas and great tips today. Moving the needle uh, starts with each of us every day in everything that we do. I agree wholeheartedly. So I, I just want to thank everyone for your, the, your time and attention and everything that you've, the, the time that you've shared, certainly thanks to our underwriters and contributors. But for AIM, I'm Teresa Resick and joined with Kevin Crane, and we thank you very much. Have a great afternoon. Bye, everybody. <laughs>